This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1746, Comic Talk Super Size Summer Spectacular, and Spider-Man Far From Home Movie Review. I'm Ian Levenstein. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Adam Murdo. And I'm Chris Everett. Comic Day Speak! Ah. <laughs> Let it all go that time. <laughs> we get there in the end. <laughs> exactly. Sweet release. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> ah, how's everybody doing on this fine summer evening? Oh, just ducky. Quack, quack. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike uh, Shane's uh, apparently wistful sarcasm, I am actually doing well. <laughs> and uh, I'm okay. <laughs> it could be worse. I mean, it could be better, but it could be worse. No, I'm just, I'm just reveling uh, in a lovely summer evening. So. It's not bad. Could be better. Could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> could be a lot worse. Yeah, but it could be a lot better, too. <laughs> Uh, I'm just glad to not be boiling on a on a summer night. It's actually uh, probably only uh, low 70s here in the in the apartment right now. So not too oh shabby. well, yeah. I'm I'm in low 70s in my air conditioned house. So yeah. <laughs> yep. He, <laughs> Murd, how goes it? Um, well, are we doing the weather report here, or uh... <laughs> I mean, I mean, either way. How am I doing in in other ways? Yeah. Uh, well, reasonably comfortable in this, uh, very well ventilated, uh, beach house in which I currently sit. However, I'm in the, l- well, one of the least ventilated rooms of the house for acoustic reasons. So it's, it's kind of, it ever <laughs> averages out <laughs> and I'm looking my wounds from a pretty severe maternal guilt trip that's been laid on me for my participation in this episode tonight. Oi, uh, oi. Uh, Ouch. Oh, the worst kind of, guilt. I had to make my mom work the night shift folks. That's oh. how much I care. Uh, Ouch. Huh. Well, sir, we're happy to have you either way. Murder another uh, CGS decoration is being uh, pinned to your lapel uh, <laughs> symbolically as we speak. Yes. Thank you, Admiral. I shall wear it with pride. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think I, I think we should start off with the mailbag, if you guys don't mind. Uh, oh, sure. Cool. Absolutely. So uh, I, I got in, I got in the uh, in the mail uh, a couple of weeks ago some goodies from uh, Mike Mike Atchison, uh and. Uh, as did I. Very good. Uh, Merge, you get something as well, correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, he sent something along for the whole gang. Yes, sir. Excellent. Uh, so what he sent me, uh, he, he went to a con in his area, and uh, Greg Capullo was there. Uh, so he went ahead and got me a Batman Last Night on Earth number one signed by Mr. Capullo. And uh, he also got uh, Deceased number one. Uh, and it looks like it's signed by both Tom Taylor and Trevor Hairsign. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yep. So uh, very, very big thanks to, uh, to Mike on that. Uh, he's, uh, he's one of our biggest supporters and uh, happy to uh, receive goodies from him in any way, shape, or form. Let me say right now for the record that Rarely has someone I've never met almost made me weep. (laughs) But (laughs) the gift that Mike so graciously procured and sent to the studio, it's a original Black Panther head sketch by Sal Valudo, who, of course, is the artist on most of the uh, Christopher Priest Black Panther run that I've praised ad nauseum on the show and is my most cherished series. Wow. And it's, it's a... Black and white profile, full head, and you know he's got he's also kind of wearing the uh, ceremonial necklace and and the amulet, and then it's personalized to me. Mike, I cannot thank you enough. This is enormously meaningful, and uh, again, deepest thanks. And also a signed copy of Black Panther thirty three from the priest run as well. Very awesome. cool. Very cool. Wonderful. He got me a uh, print by Tom Cook 
of Challenge of the Super Friends and the Legion of Doom lineups on top of one another. Like the, the, the Super Friends are on top all lined up and the Legion of Doom's on the bottom all lined up in like a like a character study. It's gorgeous. Oh, wow. I, I got to find a frame for him and hang it in the comic room somewhere. It's it's fantastic. That is awesome. Mm-hmm. So it's many, many thanks. And I was just watching old Super Friends uh, cartoons on the DC app. Challenge of the Super Friends. I started with episode one. Nice. <laughs> uh, Mike sent me, uh, well, something from the same artist animator uh, as produced your Super Friends print chain, uh, Tom Cook. Uh, it's a Skeletor because uh, he worked for both Hanna-Barbera and Filmation at different times. And in addition to that, I've got a nice big uh, print poster uh, by Gene Ha uh, depicting uh, President Superman of Earth-23. Huh. <laughs> Moving his outer garments and uh, revealing the S-shield beneath. Yeah, and it's uh, it's autographed to Murd from Gene Ha. Nice. Oh, wow. Tremendous and, artist. And, oh. uh, Mike enclosed a letter uh, to all of us in which he writes, These aren't much. Yes, they are, Mike. Yes, and they are. Like <laughs> Even having the wall space to hang them is very much a premium if you're like me, but please accept them as a small token of friendship and appreciation for all that you do. Sincerely, Mike Atchison. Well, he most definitely made my day when, when, I, when yep. I got that package, and he is doing a lot. He, yeah, again, Mike, it, we are more than happy to you know, provide the show, and, and not that we expect you know, tribute like this, but man— we really appreciate it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, we do. Yep. I wanted to mention, by the way, uh, when it comes to gifts, I have to also shout out our very own pants. Because when I went to the studio earlier in July and we did the Daredevil uh, Born Again Book of the Month Club, Pants comes in and he hands me two original pages <laughs> that he got for me. I don't know how or – you know, I'm, sometimes I'm even afraid to ask how he does it because <laughs> it's almost like it's supernatural. <laughs> but, you know, he got me two Shang-Chi Master of Kung Fu pages. One is from the uh, Monk Galassi Max series from the early 2000s. So it's Paul Galassi art. Mm-hmm. It's Shang-Chi and Liko, Liko Wu having an intimate moment on an airplane. It's beautiful. And then the crowning, I mean, he got one of my grails, okay? How many times have I talked about I've wanted a Gene Day page from Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu, the great Gene Day who penciled the series in the 80s. He died tragically young in his 30s. He got me a Gene Day page. It's, 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 it's just breathtaking. Wow. And, yeah. and it's the 80s, so all the word balloons are there. <laughs> yep. So it, it's, again, Pansy, El Panso. Ugh, you're my corduroy, baby. That's <laughs> – God – Incredible. So uh, he doesn't slack in the appreciation. No, nope. nope. we we are we are blessed, gentlemen. We are blessed. Yep. And uh, actually, speaking of uh, of pants, uh, and and the last time that he was on, uh, Shane, do you have your alternates? Oh my God, ah. I do somewhere. I let me think. <laughs> now, uh, of course, I'm referring to our top five uh, animated series of our youth episode, as uh, both Shane and uh, and Chris had to leave before sharing their alternates. So, uh, I was hoping to maybe find out what some of those juicy, juicy animated series were. <laughs> they might be on my iPad downstairs. Okay, uh, hang on a second. Yeah, no, nope, not a problem. Chris, do you have right yours, do you have yours on you? Uh, I just comes a couple off the top of my head. Sure. Um, certainly, and this shouldn't be a surprise because of the era I grew up in. I mean, Super Friends, obviously, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. Anyway, even even you know Batman talking like he's an ancient librarian. It's still, <laughs> um, that that show. So I mean, like I think some people mentioned on the forums. It's one of my one of my first introductions to some of the wider DC characters, and I have to admit, I'll, I'll do I'll do a. a therapy couch confession here i so loved aquaman i don't know why and i still love aquaman to this day that underoos were popular as a little kid i I said to my mom i want to get aquaman (laughs) underoos and it was my first pair of underoos was aquaman so you know it had a sartorial impact on me as well super (laughs) friends um so yeah super friends um Thundar the Barbarian. Mm. That's another one, although I haven't seen it in many, many years, but that definitely had an impact on me. Um, I should also, 
and some people mentioned this in the forums, I believe, too. I mentioned, of course, my top five Spider-Man and his amazing friends. But I also loved the series that was just called Spider-Man that came out at the same time. In fact, I think Amazing Friends might even come on after it or they might have even been kind of linked together for a while. I, mm. I don't remember exactly, but it was around the same time period. That's a show I look forward to every every Saturday whenever it was on uh, when I was a kid as well. Um I think th- I think that's about it. I mean, yeah, there's you know, there's Tom and Jerry, there's Looney Tunes. Right. All, I mean, I watched all hell. I even watched Mr. T when he <laughs> was yeah. Tune in, in the se- on Saturday morning. Um, I, I remember I, I love the Smurfs. So I watched them religiously for a while. Uh, hell, I even watched Pitfall when they did like some of the video games. <laughs> wow. As, I mean, yeah, still yeah, it, I, I watched the Supercade Saturday with Pitfall and Pac Man and. Donkey Kong and Mario Brothers and whatever. Yep. Yeah. And the other show I loved, and I think Merck can help me in this and Shane, because I can't remember the exact title, but I remember loving it when I was really young. What was the Hanna Barbera show with like the villain in the pilot get up? Oh, Dick Dastardly and Muttley yeah. and yeah, Yankee Doodle like, Pigeon. Yeah, I knew, see? <laughs> see, thank you, Shane. Uh, you, you both came through and me. I the Muttley impression. Yeah. Outstanding. <laughs> Yeah, I love that show too. Um, and wasn't wasn't there a show involving those characters that was a kind of a race? Wacky racers. Wacky racers. Yeah, I love that one. I watched that too. Flintstones. Um, was there a Hanna Barbera character called like the Blue Falcon? Oh yeah, Blue Dynamo. Falcon and yes. Dog Wonder. Yeah, I watched that one. So those are all yeah. ones that come to mind that I definitely watched quite a bit growing up. They they were so. on with a Scooby Doo hour, I think, right? Something like that. Right, and I should have mentioned Scooby Doo. I love Scooby Doo, especially the older ones. I watch those religiously as well. Blue Falcon also yeah. showed up uh, later on in an episode of Harvey Birdman Attorney at Law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Shane, what are yours? All right, so I have the 60s Spider Man, Dungeons and Dragons, Spider Man and His Amazing Friends, Muppet Babies, Transformers, DuckTales, Chippendales Rescue Rangers, Bugs Bunny, Looney Tunes, Tom and Jerry. Hong Kong Fooey, Josie and the Pussycats, and Josie and the Pussycats in Outer Space, yep. Wacky Races, Laugh Olympics, Pink Panther, Space Ghost, Genie, which is uh, Genie and Babu, uh, Genie from I Dream of Genie, Thundar the Barbarian, Herculoids, Grape Ape, Gummy Bear, Smurfs, Snorks, Thundercats, uh, and then it just blanked on me. Come back. Jason the Wheeled Warriors, Jabberjaw, Speed Buggy, Scooby Doo, and all its iterations, Flintstones, Jetsons, Heathcliff. I could go on and on. Wow. <laughs> Shane, Shane, a question, because I, I never really watched it much when I was a kid. And I, I, I'm sorry I didn't. What was the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon like? Oh, I loved it. I mean, it was a little silly in that they, it, was, it was like some typical shows where they always find a way to almost get home. They see their their way to do it and then it's yanked out from under them or they can't do it because in order to do it they'd have to destroy something else in the dungeons and dragons world but but i loved it i thought it was very well done how was the animation it was good for the time i mean yeah. i love all hand-drawn animation it was it like um uh, uh like battle of the planets when you have the really good action animation no not quite that good but it was you know gi joe transformers level i'd say Okay, and uh, All right. and and two things uh, to to bring up uh, real quick. Uh, Brian Rosen on the Facebook page uh, mentioned that uh, Olin Sule, uh, you know, your old man Batman voice, uh, was the Batman uh, on Super Friends until Legendary Superpower Show, and then after that, Adam West took over, and Sule, uh-huh. and Sule voiced Professor Stein. By Very the way, good. did you you? Because you remind me of something, Ian. It's not an animation, but it's mm-hmm. it's in the same general realm. Yeah. Have we all seen the superhero roast from the late seventies? <laughs> oh yes, yes. You know, I have. I've only I've only ever <laughs> seen I've already, only you know ever what? seen I, clips. I was remiss. <laughs> <laughs> now I think that is currently available on the DC app. Oh, I have I'm to check it. that, but I think it is. I'm watching it. If it's there, I'm watching it because I've only ever seen clips. So I'd love to see. Oh, the Ian! Thing. Oh, Ian! Yeah, oh! I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, I envy see. the journey. Oh man, make, make sure you're not. Make sure when it really gets going, you don't have like a beverage in your mouth. Just <laughs> yeah, TV screen. <laughs> and the 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 two that I forgot to mention on the on the on the episode that I wanted to bring up that I brought up on the forums as well. Immediately after we were done recording, I hit myself on the head for forgetting Bionic Bionic Six. Ooh. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Oh, I love Bionic 6. <laughs> it was one of the best animated 
uh, animated series of the 80s. Like, the actual animation holds up. It's crisp. Oh, yeah. And, and the beginning was, was crazy oh, good. so good. So good. It's... It, I, I always wish that there was a Fantastic Four series gr- mm-hmm. when I was growing up that had that quality to it because, yeah. you know, Bionic 6 was sort of like the Bionic Man meets fa- fa- Fantastic Four. Yep. Um, and I, I loved that growing up. Um, My absolute favorite episode of that is the one where they travel back in time to prehistoric times and somebody leaves a laser pistol that either gets stepped on, it's cracked, and that's what kills all the dinosaurs. <laughs> The radiation ah. from the leftover future tech. <laughs> Outstanding. It's clever and topical. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. Uh, and, and and the other series I forgot to mention was Doug, uh, because uh, that's of, of, okay. the, of the Nickelodeon generation. That one was one of my favorites. You know, you remind me of something. A show I never saw when I was a kid, and it was on at some point when I was a kid, mm-hmm. was the, I think it was the second Fantastic Four cartoon where they swapped out the human torch for Herbie the robot. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw anybody ever see that show? I did. Yeah. I have in the past, yeah. Okay. That was one of the shows that they would show on Cartoon Network when they had yep. nothing else to show when it was first starting up. It was that and the uh and the thing uh animated with the uh, thing ring, do your thing. They- uh. <laughs> Well, wait a minute, Ian. You don't sound like you're very impressed by the Fantastic Four cartoon. I sure wasn't. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, I mean, I I know that the urban legend is that the reason why Human Torch wasn't on it is because they didn't want kids lighting themselves on fire. That's not true. I I think the property was was licensed to somebody else. Exactly. Exactly. But uh, but still, it uh, it was severely lacking without Johnny included. It it just it just wasn't the same. (laughs) And the thing cartoon. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. was severely lacking in many other respects. Very much so. <laughs> okay, Ian. Yeah. If you go on the DC app, mm-hmm. under Movies and TV, mm-hmm. there is one season, Legends of the Superheroes. Okay. Episode one, The Challenge. Episode two, The Roast. Nice. <laughs> well, I'm doing that later tonight. <laughs> yep, they are there in all their glory. And we look forward to your field report, sir. Most definitely. 100% the case. And uh, so how about we move on to San Diego Comic-Con? Let's do it. Sure. All right. So a lot of stuff happened. <laughs> That's good, because I have the hardest time finding news about comic books from San Diego Comic-Con. Yeah, there really wasn't much of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm not crazy, because other years I haven't found it. And then, like, Pants, of course, would have, like, lists of stuff, which is fine. Right. I just could never find it. Yeah. Uh, most of the news this, this year was, uh, for the most part, uh, media related. Um, I, and I think that was intentional. I, I feel like there were plenty of panels that happened, uh, over that time. And there, there is one tidbit of news that I do actually want to touch on before we get to the movies. Um, and that was actually out of DC where, because we brought it up on multiple previews episodes, I feel like this had to be mentioned. Um, okay. Thursday afternoon at San Diego Comic-Con at the Meet the DC Publishers panel, Dan DiDio essentially admitted that the facsimile editions were a mistake because uh-huh. because facsimile editions at the moment are outselling their regular issues. Oh, wow. Um, and while that's great and all, he said that, you know, we should be focusing on moving things forward, always pushing the boundaries and finding new stories to tell. That's how we'll survive and grow this industry. So rather than, you know, reprinting comics from 30 or 40 years ago that people can find, you know, in, in, in back issue bins or on online pretty easily, um, the deal feels like it's, you know, it's a mistake to be doing that as much as they are. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, my complaint was I thought they were too expensive, and I guess I was wrong because they're, <laughs> they're selling that well. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and they're not the only ones. I mean, Marvel's doing uh, you know four dollar reprints as well, along with their along with their one dollar ones. And DC's got a whole line of one dollar ones now too. So it's it's interesting that uh, of all people, the Dio admitting that it's a mistake because he doesn't admit that wow. many things are a mistake. Mm, yeah, it's not. No. Um, well, what what do we think that says about just talking out of our butts here? What do we think that says about the new material versus the appeal of the the classic stuff? Well, I think you could say one thing in that with the way TV and movies are, the younger generation is not interested in reading stories. 
and the older generation who may have lost or been rekindled by all this TV and movie stuff or just don't have these copies in their collections are more apt to buy these older books because they want something tangible from their youth. Just like we all do. I mean, that's why I collect toys and read comics yet. But but I, I definitely think it could be that there's so much out there that satisfies the quick fix need of a younger generation that maybe they just aren't interested in the new material. Yeah. Shen, I think that's a very astute observation just because, I mean, I've said this many times, just also my my experience as a teacher is that, you know, and I'm being general here, but the average, you know, kid or, or, or younger person, reading is not necessarily a habit um, for pleasure and so forth. And I know as a retailer and, 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 and you know, all those years that there are very few kids coming in. There were some, mm-hmm. but not many buying new books to read. Um, so I, I think that I think you may be right on the money with that. Jen. I think it's as good as a theory as any because um, and I know from speaking as a, as a middle aged guy now, I still read some of the newer stuff, although I'm now I'm just waiting more for, for a lot of it to be online. But, you know, it, it's it's so not convoluted, but it just goes on and on and on because it has to because they're properties. And I find myself turning more and more to, to older stories that just f- yeah. f- partially for personal reasons, partially for just my sensibilities now as a reader, mm. they just have they have far more impact on me. Um, well, and, and, and something along with that is even even me, as much as I'm more of a DC guy, I have read a lot of Marvel in my day. But like you say, I think the, the more recent years of Marvel can be very convoluted, yeah. in my opinion. That's just my opinion. There's people that would say the same thing at DC, and I completely understand that. But then you have 23 movies and all these Netflix shows, and <laughs> that satisfies my Marvel need for the most part. Well, so think, I'm, I'm okay. I think the other part of it, too, may, may be something along the lines of what we've been saying over and over and over again on the show is that, uh, for the most part, the audience that buys you know new issues of things uh, today are the older generation and that yeah. youth are not interested as much as Absolutely. they once were. Um, yeah. And they're putting these books out for, for, for the youth. They're not really putting it out for older readers at this point. You know, They're trying to get new people in the door. I mean, sure, there's a balance, but I don't, yeah. think, I don't think you're going to find younger kids buying you know, uh, older issues of Daredevil from the 60s. Like, it's just not, it's not going to happen. Uh, but people who are, who are you know, already invested in the medium and have the money to spend will go ahead and do so, especially on their favorite facsimile editions. And and I think they're going to do it. The younger kids are going to do it. If they seek it out, it's going to be online, yes. digital, iPads, things like that, which is fine because I read a lot of stuff on, on my iPad. Absolutely. Well, let me piggyback on your point, Ian, because uh, just a, a little con field reporter, I, I don't get to many shows anymore, but I went to the uh, Garden State Comic Fest uh, the end of June in uh, Morristown, New Jersey, and it's, it's an excellent show. I, I did it as a retailer a couple of years ago and, and did well. And you know, I just went to it. That I just went this past June as a fan, and uh, it's it's really well run, and they got great guests and, and a lot of vendors. It's, it's a comic show, and you know, th- it was you know it was a good flow of people for the time I was there. But virtually everyone who was shopping were middle aged men. Mm-hmm. Um, the back issue bins, things like that. So you know, I, I just I, I think you guys are, are making astute points here. Yeah. Um. Over over at Marvel, by the way, one one of the big announcements of San Diego were, was the announcement of what the X books are going to look like uh, once uh, Jonathan Hickman's uh, miniseries House of X and Powers of X, uh, which he which he uh, astutely pointed out is actually pronounced Powers of Ten, not Powers okay. of X. Uh, what's going to follow this these miniseries up? Um, and uh, to summarize, uh, X Men will be written by Jonathan Hickman and drawn by Lionel Francis Yu. Mm. In immediately with that with that mm. with that. Team. <laughs> uh, Marauders is is going to be a series uh, coming out of this, written by Jerry Duggan and drawn by Matteo Lali of Asgardians of the Galaxy and Despicable Deadpool. So that that'll be interesting. There, I don't think there's ever been a Marauder series uh, that was an ongoing before. There has not, or I would have bought it, and I will probably be buying this one. <laughs> nice. Uh, Excalibur will be returning um, oh. with uh, Teeny Howard uh, as as the writer, uh, who wrote Age of Conan, uh, Belit, and the Thanos series before this, and drawn by Marcus Toe, uh, who's 
worked in uh, X-Men in the past. Uh, New Mutants will be spanning out of this, with, uh, which will be co-written by Hickman and Ed Brisson and drawn by uh, Rod Race. Mm. And uh, then finishing it out with Fallen Angels by Brian Edward Hill of Batman and the Outsiders uh, and with art by Seismon Kudransky of uh, The Punisher and Spawn. And then X-Force by uh, Benjamin Piercy and Joshua Kassara. And, mm-hmm. and I will mention that a lot of these series involve characters that were literally killed within the last year. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Havoc was killed three issues ago. He's on the cover of one of these. Um, <laughs> this is before Hickman's run. Hickman has essentially said that uh, a lot of what just happened in Matthew Rosenberg's run of, of, of X-Men, he is just going to be ignoring. Um, he's, mm. he's doing whatever he wants with these characters, and he's building upon it from there. And I am okay with that and not okay with it at the same time, but with what's happening in, in House of X, I can understand why some of these characters might be back. And I, I'm, not, I'm not spoiling anything to say that. It's just there's definitely some very interesting things happening in House of X, and have, I'm very intrigued. Well, Ian, hmm. once I get my shipment, I'll read that, and then we can discuss it in detail next time. Most definitely. But uh, X-Men looks like it's almost entirely a uh, summer's book. It's going to have uh, Cyclops, Young Cable, Corsair... Vulcan. Or Sam. Wow. wow. Yep. And Rachel Summers, and of course Wolverine, because Wolverine has to be in an X-Men book. <laughs> All Summers and Wolverine. Yep. And Havoc. <laughs> and Havoc, I might add. Havoc is on that, uh, that that cover, so. Wow. Yep. Very, very interested with what's going on here. And uh, the Marauders is going to be led by Captain Kate Pride and funded by Emma Frost and the Hellfire Trading Company. <laughs> 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 I know. <laughs> okay, so this is not Mr. Sinister's bunch of uh, mutant mass murderers we're talking about here. Does not appear to be, especially since Storm is on the team, and so is Iceman. So, uh, <laughs> yep, okay. Less interested all of a sudden. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. And uh, Excalibur, a uh, very eclectic group of, uh, of, of mutants in Excalibur, including uh, British Psylocke. Yes, I say British Psylocke because that's what she is again, which mm. kind of makes me happy. Uh, Jubilee, uh, a apocalypse-looking character, which may be the grown-up version of a young apocalypse that was running around for a while. Uh, Gambit, Rogue, and uh, I believe at least one other character that, I, that I'm not recognizing. It might actually be the Brian Braddock Captain Britain. I was going to say, <laughs> is anybody from the original Excalibur on the team? Yes. That's, that was my, my question. Yeah, Brian Braddock is definitely on that cover, so he's, okay. he's involved. And then New Mutants is pretty much the original New Mutants team with a couple of additions. Uh, Sunspot, huh. Wolfsbane, Mirage, Karma, Magic, and Cypher. Hmm. Yep. Cypher, you say? Cypher. It was, I thought he was killed way back when. He got better. Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Business as usual in the X-verse. <laughs> and, and I'm okay with that. I mean, we, you know, things get rebooted and restarted all the time, especially the last few years. So if he wants to reverse everything that's happened or just change it to suit his story needs, uh, why not? Yep. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's essentially what he seems to be doing. Uh, you know, he's just taking, he's taking what, what he enjoys about, about X-Men and, and building a universe around it, and considering how hard to follow and convoluted a lot of the X-Men have been over the past couple of years, essentially since Bendis left, uh, it's been a mess. And I'm, I'm hoping that Hickman will be able to write that ship a little bit, and, you know, I guess we're going to find out in a few months. Well, yeah. he's, a great, he's a great writer, so I'm definitely looking forward to giving it a shot. Most definitely, yep. And uh, that was pretty much it out of, out of Marvel. Um and I don't really see much DC news, to be honest. Um, I think they, I mean, my, my, biggest, my biggest takeaway from it is that Doomsday Clock was delayed again. Um, but uh, that, <laughs> that, that, that's to be expected, frankly, at this yep. point. Wait, that was an actual news report? Uh, it, it, at one point, it, would, it, it came okay. out in one, in one of the uh, articles that, uh, okay. that Jeff Johns had delayed again in the, another month or two, because, of course. Um, okay. <laughs> I I don't really see much else out of DC. Uh, I'm going to continue to look, though, and see if anything did come out. But the one thing that happened that weekend that I'm glad that I found out about was at the time, DC Comics was having a 60% off sale on a lot of their most recent items on Comixology. Oh, wow. Yep. So I'm now the proud owner of Hawkman uh, Volume 1. 
so I'll be able to read uh, all about it, Murd, because uh, I know you get, I know you t- you had some very positive things to say about it, and I, I really want to check it out. Oh yes, very good run. Cuts to the heart of the current DCU. Yep, and uh, the first two volumes of the Terrifics I picked up. Uh, hmm. So looking forward to read that, and I got the Mira uh, uh, graphic novel that came out. Uh, that's you know the uh, the young the young adult ver- uh, book mm. that uh, that was recently released uh, that that was getting some major praise, and I, I think I spent twenty bucks on those four volumes. Wow, wow. Ian, who who's writing Hawkman? Uh, Merge, you're probably going to know that better than I am. Uh, Robert Venditti, I believe. There okay. we go. I'm gonna have to try that because I always had a soft spot for that character, and I haven't read any of that volume. Yep. So no, neither have I. I've stayed away from it. And that first volume was drawn by Brian Hitch. Hmm. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so excellent. Looking forward to it. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, there was the the movie news, which was probably the biggest uh, reveal of the entire con at the uh, at the Marvel panel, uh, where we found out what Phase Four is going to be. Um, and it, and it looks kind of amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw, I saw, I read a big article in the times about it when that came out. Yep. Black Widow will be first out of the slate on May 1st, 2020, uh, with Scarlett Johansson, uh, Forrest, Forrest Pugh, Rachel Weiss, and David Harbour of Stranger Things as members, yes. as members of the cast. And David Harbour is not actually the one playing Taskmaster, um, I believe he's going to be playing uh, a Russian character, um, the Red Scare. I think that might be his the name. Red Red Guardian. Red Guardian. Thank you. Yes. There we go. Yep. Yeah. David Harbour will be playing Red Guardian in the in, in the movie. Oh. So that that interesting. Very. Red interesting. Guardian's a very important character in Natasha's history. Yep. So. And very that, interesting. Yep. And the Eternals was announced as well. Uh, Angelina Jolie. Uh, Selma Hayek, Kamel Nanjiani, Brian Tyree Henry, and, uh, and uh, Rachel and uh, Richard Madden, plus uh, newcomer Lauren Ridloff, and uh, surprisingly, the character Circe is not included in the in the uh, cast for the Eternals. Huh? That is surprising. Yeah, it's an I, Avenger for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah. I, I I actually I straight up thought that Angelina Jolie would be playing her, but that's not what they announced. But uh, that'll be out on November sixth, twenty twenty. And uh, they're going to have an actual uh, deaf character played by an actual deaf actress. So that's pretty cool. Uh, diversifying the line a little bit. Uh, and then the first of the um, the Marvel Plus shows will be Falcon and Winter Soldier in fall Ugh. 2020. Um, cannot wait. I cannot wait either. And Me either. <laughs> Baron Zemo will return. Oh, perfect. Yep. Same actor, right? Same actor, yep. Daniel Brühl. He, he even posted yeah. a picture, uh, Shane, on his Instagram of him wearing the purple. Uh, oh, yeah. I missed that. <laughs> Wait, they actually had him in the cowl? They sure did. Oh, wow. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that's that's really to be looked forward to. But the one that, the one that I'm fully expecting you to react to, uh, Chris, Shang-Chi and the Legend oh. of the Ten Rings. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, when I read the article, I, the just the utterly stupid, goofy, beaming smile on my face when I read that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, that will be starring uh, Simu Simu Lu of the show Kim's Convenience, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's a it's a really fun, uh, cute uh, sitcom uh, that's uh, out of Canada that you can find on Netflix. I think the first three seasons are on there. Um, and I actually got to see the uh, the play version of Kim's Convenience here in New York, uh, where the uh, the same guy who plays the father on the show, uh, who who owns the the, the 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 Korean father who owns the convenience store, uh, played the uh, the role in the play as well. And it's a much more serious version of the story. But uh, Simu Lu was not in that. He's he's only in the show. But it was it was cool to see that. And and and, and he's the lead on on the show. Uh, he's the lead character. Yeah, Simu so he's going to play Shang Chi. Yeah, okay, Simu Lu plays the uh, the son on the show, and uh, the son is essentially the lead character along with the father. Oh wow! Um, yep. And uh, we will have the real Mandarin. I was going to say that title. You have to assume the Mandarin's going to appear. Yep. I believe they cast the Mandarin too. Um, I uh, let me let me see if uh, on IMDb has it, but I know that. Uh, the, the director of this, like they they went all out on the on the director because uh, uh, this is uh, this is being directed by uh, 
uh, wait, Destin, no, okay, never mind. Uh, Destin Daniel Cretton is, is the name, is the name of the, uh, of the director. Hmm. And he's really only done things in China before. So this, this is going to be interesting to see what he's going to bring to the table. Um, but the Mandarin will be played by Tony Chu. Mm. So that's a, a, another another ca- another you know great actor that uh, that really hasn't done much uh, outside of, uh, of of Asian territories, making his way over. Well, if they really all, not not all they have to do, but if they go to the Doug Monk source material, you're not going to go wrong. Mm. So. Uh, of all the things they announced, yes, I mean you're absolutely right, and this is the one I'm most excited for. <laughs> so I'm also thinking that they may do just you know rather than do the uh, you know the yellow claw, they may just have Mandarin be his father. No, well, that could be. Yeah, it would be it would be an interesting uh, uh, twist. Well, remember his father in the comic is Fu Manchu. Oh, right, right, Fu Manchu. Thank you. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, yellow claw was a <laughs> <laughs> that was painfully it. stereotypical. Uh, <laughs> 1950s era Marvel villain that they brought back into right. the Marvel universe. Uh, I don't know if they use him anymore, but and if they do, they're not going to call him Yellow Claw. But he was in uh, Agents of Atlas most recently. Uh, he was. Okay. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But uh, not very used very sparingly, <laughs> to, say, to say the yeah. least. I think they preferred to call him Plan Chu at that point. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, for obvious reasons. No. <laughs> well, not, well, not 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 so obvious why they chose the name Plan Chu. That's actually a plot point, but uh, why they chose to call him something that wasn't the Yellow Claw. I mean, yeah. Well, uh, you know, hey, if DC can have Egg Fu, then uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love when they made him an actual egg. Yeah. <laughs> And if you want to get on more Shang Chi love, it is Murd and I did a spotlight on Shang Chi some years back, and I just it's an, it does obviously my my effusive uh, praise for the character is very much captured there. Yep. And uh, WandaVision confirmed for spring twenty twenty one with Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany, and it will feature a grown Monica Rambeau. Oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So they're they're setting up that character, I guess, for uh, future appearance in, uh, in in Captain Marvel two when that gets announced. So that'll be interesting. And uh, the Loki series will also be spring twenty twenty one. Not much out out of that except for the fact that it's probably going to include the version of uh, of Loki that uh, that made it out of uh, of Endgame. That's what I would think. Yep. And then we got now, Ian. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to inter- interrupt. I no, apologize. No, no, but please. The the. Disney app is a streaming platform is launching in November, is it not? Uh, it, it is, yes. So there's not going to be any Marvel shows when it debuts then? Correct. Correct. Yep. But okay. there's a Star Wars one. Okay. Yeah, The Mandalorian will be launching with the series. I mean, with, with, with the, uh, with, with, the yeah. uh, you know, with, with the platform. With the app. Oh, all right. Yep. And they're already discussing that it, that it may actually be available as a Hulu add-on. So rather than having to get an entirely separate app, you may just be able to purchase it like a like you would purchase, say, CBS All Access or something like that right. inside of Hulu, right. just to make life a little bit easier. But, oh. yeah. uh, the other ones are Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which I think oh. is, that's the one that has me the most uh, the most hyped. What a great title! Yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're saying it'll be the scariest uh, Marvel movie yet. Yeah. 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 Which I'm intrigued, and I hope that it involves going through the multiverse. And if they do, there has to be at least one scene with the Marvel zombies. <laughs> that would make me happy. And that, and they got to bring in the, his, one of his great uh, adversaries, Nightmare. Yes, uh, as well. Yep, definitely. And the, uh, the director of the first will be returning for this one, Scott Derrickson. All right. Yep. The What If series premieres summer 2021. Uh, that's going animated. Be animated. Yep. Yep, and the voice of Uatu will be Jeffrey <gasps> Wright. Oh, oh! oh. <laughs> the minute oh. I heard that, I I a knew you would react that way, <laughs> and, and b loved it because in my head I always kind of saw somebody like him as Uatu, and and it just it's gonna work great. And they're getting back 
as many of the original actors who played characters in the MCU to voice their characters in What If. So that'll be very, very interesting. And then uh, to round it out, uh, Hawkeye in Fall 2021, uh, featuring uh, uh, it, both Hawkeyes. So it'll be uh, you know Jeremy Renner and uh, Kate Bishop. So that'll that'll be what's going on there. And then Thor: Love and Thunder, directed by Taika Waititi, with a female Thor played by Natalie Portman. Natalie Portman, yep. Yep. So that's. All came out of there. Oh, and as they were walking out, Blade was announced. I'm yeah, extremely excited right. for that one because the actor they've selected is pitch perfect for yeah. that role. And he went to them. That's Did he really? Yeah. Okay. What what they, what uh, essentially what Kevin Feige said is he got a phone call from Marishal Ali one day, and and he was just like, "Let's make a deal," and uh, they they decided to do Blade, and. This is being pre-announced, essentially. Like, this will not actually really be a part of this phase. They just wanted to make sure that, uh, that people knew that it was coming, um, which is why it's not on that timeline. So we may not even see that for another five years. Now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, but it's going to happen. And it unfortunately says to me that the Netflix shows are probably done. Um, just because even if he's, you know, even if that character is no longer really involved with the Luke Cage show... Uh, having having an actor, you know, involved with the movies that was involved with the Netflix shows like this, playing an entirely different character, my my hopes of them saving those series is kind of going on the wayside. That's a bit. good point because he played Cottonmouth in the uh, yeah. magnificent first season of Luke Cage. Yep, and he's he's a tremendous actor. He's an Oscar winning actor. Um, he's won two Oscars actually, and. When they when I read that, besides Shang Chi, that's also what got me the most jazzed because um, I really enjoyed the Wesley Snipes films. Well, especially the, the first and the second, the third one not so much. But um, there's so much they could do with Blade, and, and, if, and if they can bring in that supernatural monster uh, aspect of the Marvel universe, uh, that'd be absolutely thrilling to see. Uh, especially if they integrate it into the wider Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, if yeah. it, I mean, if they show Dracula, I mean, who knows? But I'm extremely excited for that. Most definitely, yeah. And uh, they they mentioned as well that Black Panther 2, Captain Marvel 2, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and oh, a Fantastic Four film are still to come. <laughs> they did essentially confirm that Fantastic Four and Mutants are, are, are in the future of, uh, of the MCU. They just haven't gotten around to announcing it yet. Oh, so they, they did make it... A, a, a... A reference to the X Men, then. In they, a way. Yes, they did. Yeah, they said and mutants. Uh, at least okay. one. At least one place mis- misreported it by saying new mutants, and I immediately mm. went new because that movie is going straight to who of anything. I think it's it's dead in the water. <laughs> yep. So, very interesting. Um, w- w- of all of these, like which which ones are you guys looking forward to the most? Oh, all of them. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I have a hard time picking one. I mean, it's been a great ride since 2008 with these movies. I, 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 I can't see, like, I don't, I don't have one that I go to, well, other than The Incredible Hulk, which is sort of in there. I mean, I know it is, but that's the only one that I go, eh, okay. Mm-hmm. All the other ones I like, and I've watched over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really don't know what a favorite would be. It's all exciting. Yeah, for for me, it's either the what if or the what if series or the uh, multiverse of madness because those those are the ones that uh, intrigue me the most. As a huge fan of of multiverses, I I it's right up my alley. Well, and, and I guess I am hyped for these Disney shows because I love the fact that they're in the Marvel MCU and the actors from the movies are going to be the characters on the show. I mean, I, I, I love that. Yeah, definitely. I'm also intrigued about how they're going to adapt, uh, Jason Aaron's outstanding run of, uh, Jane Foster's Thor into the film. Um, that's, I was really also very excited by that announcement. Um, they they had the image of the hammer being handed to Natalie Portman, 
uh, on stage. And I enjoyed her performances. I mean, I like her most things. Her performance is Jane, and I'm really interested to see how, how they do that. Well, I think everyone but Kevin Moyer will be happy about this. Uh, this <laughs> 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 I remember when I posted about it uh, to, to Facebook, he was the one person who responded with an angry emote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mur- Murd, which one which one catches your fancy the most? Uh, well, it's a little too far in advance for my enthusiasm really to be whetted about any of them. Mm. And, you know, you can just rule out any of the series projects because they're all going to be streaming and not on real television, so I won't <laughs> get to see them anyway. <laughs> so let's just uh, ditto, ditto what you said, Ian, about you know, the Doctor Strange project has the word multiverse in the title. So let's say that's the one that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And uh, over at DC, by the way, there were some slight announcements. Uh, for one, uh, Young Justice Season 4 is a go. Yeah, oh, I did see terrific. that. Yep. I'm excited about that. Very, very happy about that. And uh, that uh, Doom Patrol Season 2 is official, and it's going to be joint streaming. It's going to be on both the DC Universe app and this new HBO Max thing that uh, that time that Warner Brothers is going to be watching. So I... Okay. I'm a little scared about that because it, it may say to me that the DC Universe app may be, you know, not going to last very long. But hopefully that just means that it's just available in as many places as possible. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm hoping. Yep. Try, trying something different that other apps, other companies are reluctant to do is is share their wares. Right. Maybe. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm hoping. Yeah. I, I, I hope so, too. And... uh I mean, if if anything, if they if they at least you know if they somehow announce that uh, that the DC app is going to you know lose the lose the streaming shows and be cut by three dollars and just have all the comics, it won't be mm-hmm. the worst thing in the world for me. But I'm hoping that's not the route that they wind up going in the end. We'll yeah, see. I hope not too. Yeah. Um, oh, and and a Superman Red Sun animated movie is officially a go. Ooh. Uh, yep. 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 Really looking forward to that. That's a classic story. <laughs> yes. Ugh. And they're doing an, a, and they're all doing another Superman uh, animated movie as well uh, that they announced at, uh, in, at there. I think it, I think it's called either like Superman Man of Tomorrow or something like that. And it's oh, I it, didn't see that. It's yeah, uh, it, it's very much against the grain for them, just because uh, you know usually they only they only stick to one uh, solo and then uh, and then do something else so like justice league related or something but uh, they're doing a uh, i think an original superman story uh, hmm. for an animated movie so and what's the release date for the red sun Ian? do they announce that i don't believe they did but i i, okay. I, would, I would expect it sometime in either fall or uh, or you know like novemberish i would i would think yeah, yeah. looking yeah. forward to that yep i did i did like all of the arrow versus crisis crossover rumors that are going about i hope most of them are true mm-hmm. for all the special guest people that might show up oh um well one was confirmed and, and that one was confirmed <laughs> uh that uh that uh hen- that we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing a return of uh of a certain superman uh, yeah and yep. uh, it'll be a in a kingdom come style which yep. uh which mm. which has me intrigued brandon ralph will be putting back on the uh oh the, the wow suit. yep the super suit and uh yeah he'll be kingdom come superman Yep, oh, and wow. all kinds of other rumors flying about about old time DC TV people. Hopefully, it's all true, or at least some of it. Yeah, in some way, I I'll believe it when but, it's when it's officially announced by DC. Yes, yeah, yeah uh, me too. A bunch of those were from some shady websites. Is that yep. supposed to be? Is that supposed to be in the fall? The Crisis story. It takes place in the beginning. It it it's it split up. The fall has some, and then they break, and then it comes back to finish. Is it is it a crossover among all the the DC series on TV right now? Uh, all except Black Lightning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the other four are in, well, five with, uh, yeah, Batwoman, Arrow, Flash, Legends. Yeah. Because I'm hopeless, I'll, I'll never catch up on these shows. But I'm just going to say to hell with it and plunge in and just watch this. Oh, uh, so yeah, I'm so I, intrigued. I just binged what I was not, what I didn't see of Supergirl and all of Legends because I had not watched that at all this year. And um, I really loved Constantine in the mix and everything they did with him. I was a little disappointed in the last couple minutes for how it ended, but mm. it's not bad. It's just I was hoping for something just a tad teeny weeny bit different. <laughs> uh, 
Supergirl, I, I really thought the first half of the season was a little bit slow. Once they brought in Lex Luthor, I really thought John Cryer did a great job. I love those couple episodes he was in, and I like the story that they continued and ended with. Uh, some things were tied up a little bit too neatly, too quickly, um, but that might have ramifications later. And I was okay with how that ended. I'm, I'm, I was more intrigued to, to get to the point where I could see what they did with John Cryer as Lex Luthor and where yeah. they took that, and, and I, I was happy. It was fun. Yeah, I got a I got a half a season to go on Supergirl, and I got a half a season to go on Legends of Tomorrow, and I'm like two seasons behind on Arrow, and I don't actually know if I care about catching up. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I like Arrow. I'm glad I watched it, but I'm not unhappy that it's ending. Well, th- they they did announce uh, who the villain is going to be in the new season of The Flash. Um, that uh, the uh, oh god, the, the guy who played uh, Suresh on Heroes. Um, oh, is is going to be is going to be playing uh, the the quote unquote ba- big bad of this of this upcoming season. Um, trying to find trying to find uh, his his name because I'm I'm blanking on it of course because I re- forget every single name that I try to remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be nice if it were Savitar, but they've already used that one. <laughs> yes, that is that is correct. Yeah, uh, uh, Set Set Hill Ramamurthy uh, is is the name of the actor. Um, and he's going to be joining the Flash in this uh, in this new season. Um, and I think I, let me let me find out the name of the uh, of the. Uh, so is this coming season of Arrow the last season? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Blood work, guys. Guys, give me a minute. I have to go downstairs for something. I'll be right back. Not a problem. Sure. Just uh, keep going. Yeah. Uh, he's going to be playing bl- Blood Work on season six of the Flash. Um. So I don't know if I don't know if that's the the quote unquote big bad or if it's just. A, a character that they're bringing on, but I noted that that uh, from the trailer that I watched, it looked like he has a, a major vendetta against the Flash team, and uh, I think he's trying to essentially reverse powers, um, which seems to be a going trend with the Flash. But uh, we'll 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 see where that goes in the long run. What's the character's name again, Ian? Uh, Bloodwork. Bloodwork. Hmm. Yeah, must be a newer introduction. Yeah, I don't recognize it. Right, that doesn't doesn't ring a bell for me either, to be honest. Mm. Um, I think it might be a new Fifty Two character, but I yeah you know, could you be know, my my guess. I'm sure, some of the forums could help us out with that. Exactly. Yep. And uh, I think that's just about it with uh, with San Diego stuff. Uh, you know. It, I, oh, oh, actually, no. One more. One more thing. Uh, Picard. Okay, when when is it premiering? Star Trek Picard. Um, I don't think they they actually gave the uh, the official premiere, um, okay. but they did release the trailer, and from the looks of that, I am so much more excited for this than I was previously. Oh, I'll have to watch the trailer. I haven't seen it yet. Okay, yeah. uh, a bunch of a bunch of characters that I was not expecting to be in the series are going to be in it uh, from. From multiple iterations of Star Trek. Oh, wonderful! Yep. Okay. Yeah, and it's gonna be it's gonna be taking place, I think, twenty years after uh, Picard leaves Starfleet, and uh, picking up there where uh, where a mysterious girl uh, goes to Picard for help, and when he when he doesn't get the help he wants from Starfleet, he takes matters into his own hands. Now, do they at least say is it coming out this fall, next year, and, and no? I think it's early twenty twenty. Um, okay, but don't quote me on that. Uh, it's been it's it's been hard. Yeah, but yeah, early twenty twenty. Yeah, and is is it only going to be on their 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 streaming channel? CBS All Access as of now. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. It. Yep. Um, now, uh, will they do the first episode on their main network? They did that for Discovery. I remember that. I it, don't know if they're going to do that again. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, but then yeah. again, uh, they're trying to get more and more people to just straight up buy this thing. So it wouldn't surprise me also yeah. if they just say screw it and you know make people go straight there. Um, there's more of a chance of this also eventually being released on Blu-ray because this seems like the type of series that you know people are going to want on their shelves one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, some of the some of the new uh, characters being introduced, like Allison Pill, is one of my favorite actresses. And oh, she, and, and yeah, she's, and excellent. She's, and she's going to be playing a character on this new show and. Uh, 
uh, and a bunch of other uh, really cool actors. Uh, so I, I don't want to I don't want to give it away until you wind up seeing the uh, the trailer because frankly, it's it's actually worth the surprise. I'm going to watch it as soon as we're done here. Excellent. All right. Yep. While we're on the subject of uh, Star Trek uh, related proper uh, programs mm-hmm. uh, projects. Um, is everybody aware of the Star Trek animated series that's in the works? Yes. No. Yeah. There's uh, there's two of them actually. Mm. Yeah. One is being worked on, I think, by the Rick and Morty guys, and then there's and then there's one that's uh, that's being made for Nickelodeon. Mm. Yes, I was thinking of the Nickelodeon one. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, I know that was announced a few months ago, but uh, there more developments are uh, leaking out. Um, and I'm happy it's going to be on basic cable. Uh, apparently the. The premise I'm not entirely in love with. It's going to involve a bunch of uh, space-faring juvenile delinquents who uh, come across an abandoned Starfleet vessel and use it to go joyriding around the, the Federation space. Um, but uh, the exciting thing about it is uh, they've just recently announced who's going to be in the writer's room, and it includes Julie Benson and Shauna Benson. Oh, hey. fantastic. Happy to hear it. Well yeah. done. <laughs> and it's just quadrupled my interest in the entire project um yeah like i said it's like i could think of better uh foci for a star trek animated series and uh, i'm also a little disappointed that it's going to be cgi as opposed to cell animation but that that's just the way you know tv animation seems to be going these days especially for action series um so yeah and it's going to be on basic cable so i will definitely give it a look when uh, it, it comes to us it's it's so much in the planning stages they don't even have a title for it yet hmm Okay, interesting. And what was the other one, Ian? Uh, the, the other one, the other one is, uh, uh, I, I believe from the from the Rick and Morty guys, um, and it's called Lower Decks. Um, this one uh, does have a general premise from from what I know about it. Uh, reading about it right here, uh, it's it's not it's not exactly going to be like uh, Rick and Morty. It's probably going to be a little bit more serious. So that's. That's actually a good thing to to hear because I think uh, um, if it, if it was a little bit too ridiculous, I may I may be I may be less thrilled. Um, but I think uh, Jerry O'Connell was one of the names that I heard involved uh, with, oh. with, with this with this series. Mm-hmm. And uh, trying to get the full the full cast list. Here we go. Okay. So the so the premise is. Uh, it's uh, the support crew serving on one of Starfleet's least important ships in, in, in 2380. Um, and uh, Tawny Newsom, uh, Noel Wells, uh, Jerry O'Connell, and a uh, couple bunch of other people that I haven't heard of are, are, are in the cast. Um, so, uh, yeah, it just looks like it's going to be a little bit more of a, of a, of a chill version of, uh, of, hmm. of Star Trek. You know, the, the guys that you don't usually wind up seeing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm I'm back. What what's that show? Uh Star Trek Lower Decks was the one that I was discussing. Oh. And uh what you missed wow. was was Murd discussing the Nickelodeon Star Trek animated series with uh which Julian Sean are Sean, working yeah, on. Yeah, that I saw. I can't wait for that. Yep. 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 And before that uh, Ian was talking about the Picard series, which looks awesome too. Yes, it does. Yep. Yeah, uh, Chris hasn't seen the trailer yet, so I'm leaving, oh, leaving it up to, yeah, to I'm watch his it. Oh, you just you just you just did a verbal uh, I, ejaculation I did, like me, man. I did you. I did you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll watch the trailer as soon as we're done here. Excellent. Just watch. Soon I'll be going. <laughs> Shane, Shane, now wait a minute. No one should choose to sound like that when they laugh. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, but when we when we make fun of you for it, it's kind of okay. Yeah, of course. Well, it is. Only, only because you're okay with it. <laughs> of course, I, l- I love being a, a, a comedic muse. <laughs> oh, and uh, and and, and Murd, Before I forget, I have a little bit of trivia associated with uh, what we were what we were just discussing. Uh... Ah! That's the truth. Yep, 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 yep. Ah. It's that time once again, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. It's time for Muddle the Murd. <laughs> when did we get Wolfman Jack? Uh, just now. <laughs> he speaks with the pompadus of Murd. <laughs> it's, it's time for the Muddle the Murd. I'm either doing that or I'm doing 90s Wolverine. I'm not sure. So. <laughs> Let's go, bub. <laughs> At least you don't have an accent when you do that. Oh, <laughs> hey, shrimp on the Bobby. I'm from Canada. 
<laughs> I still love those those appearances. Uh, and 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 Pride of the X Men. Don't forget Pride of the X Men. <laughs> well, yes, it is once again time for Muddle the Murd, our trivia segment here on the show. And Murd, explain to them how they can try to muddle the bird. Uh, well, in order to accomplish that, Ian, uh, they must come up with three different comic book trivia questions, one about Marvel, one about DC, and one about some third publisher's products. And uh, you also have to break them down uh, in terms of chronology. One of them has to be about comics published before 1970, one about comics published between 1970 and 2000, inclusive, and one about comics published after the year 2000. Uh, and uh, then just email them in to uh, comicgeekspeak at gmail.com with Muddle the Murd in the subject line. Don't forget to include answers to the questions you're asking. And then they will be posed to me by our quiz master, Ian. And if I fail to answer even one of those three questions correctly, uh, you will have successfully muddled me and you will, uh, uh, you will have earned a prize, which will be mailed to you at uh, the Murd's own personal expense. <laughs> and what is that prize today? Uh, well, uh... He is just still going through this uh, cache of artwork uh, donated to us by an anonymous donor. And uh, we're still playing for a drawing of the Game of Thrones character Jon Snow uh, by artist Tommy Patterson. Very nice. Well, let's see whether you know something or whether you know nothing. <laughs> My guess is somewhere in between. All righty. Well, th- this one uh, is uh, brought to us by first-time muddler Jonathan Eep, uh, so he actually uh, says on the back on the, on the bottom here how to pronounce his last name, so let me not butcher it. Uh, Jonathan Abley. So uh, this is his first attempt, and the th- this has a theme, Murd. Oh, those are always fun. Yep, the theme is let's go shopping, <laughs> <laughs> and we begin with question one, Archie Comics, Volume One, Number Ninety Eight. February mm-hmm. 1959. Archie goes shopping with Veronica for a Christmas present for Veronica's cousin. Later in the same issue, and many comic years later, Archie is set up by Jughead to go on a date with the same cousin. What is the name of Veronica's cousin? Mm. And this is a character that probably appeared later in Archie comics, since... All the pages they had to fill, they reused every concept they could. <sighs> yep, but uh, the, yeah, I do not know the answer. I'm going to say Wilma. Nope. Anybody got a guess? Uh, nope. The answer is Alice Fleeble. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fleeble. Okay. <laughs> Spelled F L to say. <laughs> Spelled F L E E B L E. Would have been even more fun to say if I'd said it when it wasn't too late to give the right answer. But that's (laughs) neither here nor there. (laughs) Well, let's see how you do with question two, which is a Marvel question. Alpha Flight, volume one, number 26, September 1985. Alpha Flight must combat a group of villains called Omega Flight at a shopping mall, which at the time was no, was known as the largest shopping mall in the world. What is the name of the shopping mall providing the setting for this story? I'm going to guess the Mall of America in Minnesota. Anybody else got a guess? No, but I, I think there was a Claremont Burn X-Men store where they were in this mall, too, although I'm not positive about that. Damn it. Go ahead. Well, it's a very Canadian mall. The West Edmonton, uh. the West Edmonton Molly. <laughs> Nowhere near it. Nope. Well, I mean, I mean, Minnesota's not too far from Canada, so I mean, you were close. Yeah, I guess geographically, yeah. yeah. Although West Edmonton, I mean, that's yeah, that, that's out in the Prairie Provinces, so <laughs> still, still not that close, really. Yeah. Uh, well, well, let's see how you do with uh, question three. DC, Wonder Woman. Volume 5, number 10, January 2017. Wonder Woman defeats a group of terrorists known as the Seer Group at an incident at a shopping mall. In what city is the shopping mall located? (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Yeah, 
yeah, these <laughs> no no punches pulled here. Uh, so it's basically just a matter of naming a city, I guess. Um, and it could be either a DC Universe city or a real world city. Good point, Murd. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to go with a real world. Uh, Oklahoma City. I'll give you a hint. We were just talking about this city. Hmm. San Diego? Ding, ding, ding. After you're getting it wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have been supermarket swept. <laughs> uh, well, I hope you like Jon Snow, John. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, <it's... laughs> yep. It's, uh... Very effectively managed muddle there, Jonathan. You've uh, you, you've well earned your prize. Yep. And, I, and uh, does Jonathan include a mailing address in his email? Uh, he does not. He does. He just says he's from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So ah. we're going to have to do a follow up email. There we go, Edmonton. Okay. Well, I'll I'll yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with him. Yep. Sorry, eh? you lost. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to start quoting Strange Brew now, aren't you? Man, <laughs> you hoser. <laughs> now, now, before we transition on to uh, Far From Home, I just wanted to mention uh, very qu- quickly that uh, they added uh, up to issue 12 of uh, the Immortal Hulk on, uh, on, a, on an Unlimited. So I have now read up to an, uh, issue 13 because issue 12 was amazing. That is, I don't think I've read 12 yet, actually, now that I think about it. Just came out this week, sir. Yeah, I haven't read it yet. Um, it's one of the most thrilling comic book series out today. It's, it's amazing. so good, yeah. Um, yeah. So now we're up to January. One other comment I want to make is this is especially for Shane, because we were talking about this in our last uh, Comic Talk discussion. Uh-huh. Shane, I got so nostalgic for Buck Rogers. <laughs> Next day I ordered season one DVD. Oh. And, and the one, just the one thing I want to share. And some of the listeners in the audience, will, I'm sure, will be familiar with this. So the first episode, of course, is the movie. Oh, yeah. That before it was on TV was in theaters. This is yep. 1979. Yep. And when I put on the DVD, they were playing the version that was – I think it's the version from the theater, which I had never seen because they modified it for the television mm-hmm. version. So, for example, so they have, they have you know, a whole opening credits like a movie. Have you seen this, Shane? Oh, yes, yes, and there's a so, song. Wait. Oh, there's a song. Yeah. <laughs> Far I, away. I, I, oh, da, Shane, da. I stood up I stood up on my feet and raised my arms like a touchdown. Because uh-huh. the song is so magnificently bad. Oh, yes. And, and they have, like, women cavorting in, like, space suits. On, yeah, like, the, and, and the they're, they're kind of rolling around. <laughs> and then and there's a dream sequence where, like, yeah. Bob's astronaut suit yeah you know, like woman's rolling around with him on the logo I, yeah I, I, I couldn't like i was absolutely dumbstruck <laughs> i was like this is one of the like one of the best 15 dollars i've ever spent in my life <laughs> i was so floored by, by just this opening credits and, i mean the, uh, sh- the show itself is worth it i love the show oh, I, it's a lot of fun but, but i, 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 but I to see that crazy. the first time <laughs> yeah i was like wait a minute i don't i don't remember that <laughs> It gives new meaning to the phrase "a product of its time." Oh, yeah. God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's all I wanted to say about that. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I also, uh, gosh, I, I'm remiss at forgetting who prompted us about the book. I did order it. I did start to read it. I didn't finish it. It's on my pile to finish. Um, but it was a lot of fun so far. Oh, Drew wish... Gaska. Drew Gaska does great stuff. That's, yeah, I wish there was more of it. I. Um, uh, <sighs> disappointing that it's just that one so far oh uh and two more two more things actually uh that, that i that i almost forgot Murd uh also related to our last previews episode uh they just canceled the solicits for the first three issues of wildcats yeah oh. i got that email too so Jeez. i don't know whether that's an ellis thing or a production thing or what but yeah it's a little disappointing but uh I'll, it's a I'll disappointing be- thing yeah yeah yeah, I I have a feeling it's because he's he's got too many uh, things on his plate, and he was nowhere near done with issue four. So they they're uh, probably going to resolicit it for later this year. Uh, one would assume. Yep. And uh, the other thing was uh, it's not exactly it's not a spoiler for the movie, uh, but uh, I will say that there are some tasty uh, Batman TV show nuggets in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. 
Uh, oh so, wow! Yeah. So any anybody? Oh, I, I I really enjoyed that film. It was excellent, and uh, not at all was that what I was expecting. One of the slowest moving Tarantino movies uh, I've ever seen, but I mean it in a good way. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna see it again because I I really I was still absorbing it after I saw it the first time. Yeah. And like you said, Ian, it's not the pace of it is not like most of his other films. Um, although if you go back to Jackie Brown, which is actually one of my favorite Tarantino films, Mm -hmm. it also has more of a pace like that to some degree. Uh, but, but this movie, this movie builds (laughs) into something that you just have to see it. Oh my Uh, God. Yeah. But the, 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 the finale of the film gives real credence to why he applied the title he did. Um, and it's, I, 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 I'm looking forward to seeing it again. I, I mean, I don't think it's for everybody. Like when I left the theater, some people were like, "Oh, that movie was so goddamn slow." Like yeah. some of the people in the bathroom. But <laughs> if, if, if yeah, guys, at the urinal were complaining. But if you if you, if you love if you want to just see this pitch perfect, and it's his perspective, Tarantino's perspective on what 1969 was and how he perceived it. Yep. Um, it, it, it's it's breathtaking filmmaking, and and one other thing. Damian Lewis gives the most spot on Steve McQueen. Oh my God! Yes, I, I, I'm a huge Steve McQueen fan, and I, I was I was just like in awe in my seat. And the other thing I'll say is the guy who played Bruce Lee. Oh man, I mean that was that was just a, a treat as well. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I'm hoping to see it again one more time because uh, there's at least one movie theater in New York that's showing it in 70 millimeter. And oh, oh wow, yeah, that yeah. would be that would be a sight to see to say the least. Yeah. And uh, we are now joined by Matt. Hey, hey guys, how you doing? Hey, hey. Hello. And now that Matt's here, we transition over to Spider-Man. Spider-Man does whatever a spider whatever can. Spider can. <laughs> Spins a web and decides catch thieves just like flies. Look out! Here come the Spider-Man. Woohoo! <laughs> is, that the, is that the opener for the episode? Uh, sure. <laughs> more, it's strong. This is radioactive blood. That's uh, uh, Paul Schaefer and his band playing into your seat. Now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> more like it, yeah. <laughs> and uh, obviously, spoilers for the, for this point forward for uh, for Spider Man Far From Home, everybody. So if you have not seen that movie, come back when you have. <laughs> it came out actually it came out almost a month ago. Now we're just getting to it now because of our different schedules. So. Yep. I'm sure most people listening have seen it by now. Yep. And uh, I, I I think we might as well start off with uh, with Matt since he just joined us. Uh, huh. uh, Matt, what would you think? Uh, it was, I would say it's at least on par with what I felt about the first one, mm-hmm. uh, Far From Home, uh, um, Homecoming. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of a, a mid-tier MCU movie. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> oh. Controversy. Oh. oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> Buckle up, kids. <laughs> I think we're gonna have some nice varying opinions on this episode. Well, yeah, probably. <laughs> and now for something completely different. Shane, what'd you think? I loved it. <laughs> I love that Mysterio was in it. I love the way they did it. I didn't expect the way they created Mysterio and how they got to it to be the end result um the only thing that disappointed me is i feel that at some point you have to get away from tony stark being the impetus for absolutely everything yes and i think that, i think the purpose of the movie was to do that though that that's what i'm hoping yeah. um but yeah i thought it was a lot of fun to watch the the kids enjoyed it i saw it once in the theater with both of them and then we went to a drive-in up above allentown and saw it again uh, with Toy Story 4. So, yeah, I had a great time. I loved it. And Chris? I, sh- I more or less echo Shane's sentiments. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I-, I-, I think of all the, char- the actors who've played Spider-Man on screen now, I, I think Tom Holland is-, is heads and tails above the rest. Be- and I like the others in different ways, but I think he captures both Peter Parker and Spider-Man that balance uh, better than all the other actors have p- played the character. And, and I 100% agree with that. Yeah. And um, like Shane, the way they use Mysterio, I, I thought was magnificent. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about how I 
the, oh, I, I felt seeing Silver Age Ramita pages come to life in that movie. Um, it, it's uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and, and as what Shane was referencing before, one of the things that I really liked about the film, just in brief now, is that I, they, they also use the story to show that he's now really finally moving away from sort of being under the shadow of Tony. Yeah. Essentially. Yep. So, so. And hey, J. Jonah Jameson. So. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. God, uh, how they kept that quiet is beyond me. Yep. And, and this is the second time he's played him in the last year because he was also in the Spider-Man video game. Uh, they had uh, J. Jonah Jameson oh, doing, yeah. a, doing yeah. a podcast in a, in a very similar fashion to the way they, they introduce him here. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Murd? Uh, well, I find myself agreeing with uh, a lot of things that have been said so far, including by Matt. Um, yeah, this I, I really was not into Spider-Man Homecoming very much at all. Um, but uh, sure enough, I liked this one a lot better than I did that last one. Um, I, I agree with Shane that uh, Mysterio was great. I mean, I went into the, the, the whole reason I was able to justify my going to see this movie in the first place was because of the Mysterio content. I refer to it my, to, to myself in my own mind as the Mysterio movie. I'm going to go see the <laughs> Mysterio movie that has a character that they call Spider-Man in it. Uh, and sure enough, what they did with Mysterio was very much on point. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure they knew going in, nobody was going to fall for uh, uh, Mysterio's grand design here. Nobody was going to buy him as a hero sincerely for any length of time but uh, just his yeah. his rationale his motives uh, his his origin i mean they they tweaked it from the comics but they tweaked it to what is the probably the most classic silver age marvel villain story there can be you know disgruntled discontented former corporate employee who yeah. feels his genius is undervalued and turns to crime um, so yeah, everything about Mysterio, I love the, even the, the costume looked great on film as mm -hmm. us true believers have always known it would be, they barely needed to change a thing. Yep. Um, I agree with Chris that, uh, Tom Holland is probably the best, uh, live action Spider-Man we've ever seen. I love his take on the character, just good old everyday 16 year old Peter Parker. Um, although I will say that, uh, the take, well, the MCU's take on spider-man this whole iron man's little pal peter parker thing is just <laughs> does not work for me in the least i agree with all that's been said so far that he really needs to get out from under tony's shadow and but but i am not as convinced as some of you are that this movie really accomplished that yet i mean it, in the course of the film peter doesn't really get into too many scrapes that uh, he's able to get out of himself without happy hogan flying in with some more stark international technology to pull his fat out of the fire you know it's as, as i said when we reviewed homecoming um having him being the understudy to iron man really detracts from you know the, the diy spirit of the original character he, he's not able to <sighs> come up with his own solutions to his problems. He's just relying on this super this super corporate savior and his miraculous technology to save him every step of the way. And in the third movie, maybe we'll see that he has, in fact, accomplished this, but I, I personally did not see the proof of it in the resolution of this movie. Um, I liked uh, what they did with the, the whole Euro trip concept. It was, frankly, I, I thought more fun than anything that happened in New York in the last movie. Uh, I think they took some of the edges off the MJ character. I liked her more. Uh, the Ned and Betty Brandt little romantic, obnoxiously <laughs> cute teenage romance. That that was a good little subplot. I appreciate yeah. the yeah. of that. Um, oh, there, there was another thing I was going to mention just now, but it's long. oh oh yes, uh, the blip. I, I do think that they needed to take that a little more seriously than they did. You know, address the whole five year later gap instead of just you know using it for laughs in the opening twenty minutes of the movie and then never mentioning it again. Although, in fairness to the screenwriters, they probably had the script for this thing mostly, if not entirely, completed by the yeah. time they were informed that uh, this five year gap was a concept they'd have to address. Yeah, oh, very true. Uh, so yeah, that could have been better. And I was a little disappointed we didn't get more of the fallout from the cliffhanger from the last movie with Aunt May walking in on Peter changing. And then suddenly we jump into this movie and, you know, she's a little bit too into the fact that he's Spider-Man to the point of meddling in his activities as such. So yeah, th th there's a number of things I would have done differently, but on the whole, just for Mysterio alone, it, it, it was a step forward as far as I'm concerned in this in this permutation of the Spider-Man on the big screen. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm happy I went, liked it pretty much. I, I, I feel like uh, uh, that Marvel has been doing its best uh, the past couple of movies to fix their villain problem because the villains have always sort of felt a little bit flat. 
uh, before, say, the last like maybe four or five releases. And this continues to fix that problem beautifully. Yes, because Dylan Hall was anything but flat as Mysterio. Definitely, a hundred percent. Shane, were you going to say something? No, uh, no, no. I, I, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what I, what I was what I was going to say is uh, so what I appreciate a lot about F- Spider Man Far From Home um, is actually in the way that it references Iron Man and what happened to him and the fact that. Happy Hogan is a part of this movie is significant because who started the Marvel Cinematic Universe? John yeah. John Favreau. You know, without John Favreau's directing, the Marvel Cinematic Universe wouldn't have happened because you know he's the one who brought life into it by making Spider Man, uh, making Iron Man in a cave with a box of scraps. Like that's that's what he did, and and he 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 absolutely helped this become what it was and in this movie it was nice to see you know John Favreau's Happy Hogan essentially recognizing that this is a new era for the Marvel Cinematic Universe because there he is watching Peter you know essentially come into his own as he's making this new suit for himself and as he's you know uh you know growing up as a person uh, well, Ian, you hit upon, if I may jump in for a moment, Yeah, one of the, I think one of the most important scenes in the movie is near the end when they're on the plane yeah. and Peter is, is using the technology in the plane, but if we, his own knowledge and his own mind yep. to construct uh, a suit or whatever he was doing. And they just watch, see Happy, you know, sitting in the cockpit watching Peter and he gets that knowing look on his face mm-hmm. and you can almost like imagine thinking, so this is what I'm going to work for now. Yep. Um, so I really enjoyed that scene. Yeah. Now, now I think that works for the MCU that we've come to know and love, but I don't disagree with Adam and probably Matt that it's a little too easy for Peter to have everything when he's given everything to work with. There, sure. There's, there is a little bit that he hasn't figured out on his own because he's always had Stark tech to back him up. So I don't disagree with that because I, I don't see him just completely stepped away from Tony yet. I'm hoping with the way the end extra credit scene happened yeah. that now we'll get that because I don't know how they'll get out of it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm excited to see how they'll get out of it. Well, what's, yeah. what's everybody's favorite Spider-Man trope? You know, every single time Peter Parker gets something great, something oh, terrible yeah. happens. That old like terrible Parker. happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's absolutely what happened here in this movie, which is why I think it, exactly what you're saying, uh, uh, Shane, is that next movie we're really going to start to see, you know, a Spider-Man that's a little bit closer to the comic book one because yeah. he's going to be the hated Spider-Man and he's going to have to, you know, do a lot of things on his own as opposed to relying so much on Stark Tech. But I guess he's a menace! And, <laughs> and, I, and I do think that they will get to where there's a good chance in some way that nobody will know who Peter is again, yeah. but that'll happen at the end. Right. Uh, and, and I, I swear to God, if it's uh, Mephisto, then I quit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hope it's not. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually, I actually think that, uh, well, I, I've got, I've got thoughts uh, as we continue to talk more on this uh, about Mysterio that, that I'm going to, that I'm going to drop on you guys. And uh, also on um, perhaps his way out of this later on, but uh Overall, uh, Tom Holland came, further came into his own in this movie. Um, Zendaya definitely came more into her oh, own her. In, in this. Yeah, because um, I've yeah. been loving her on Euphoria on HBO. Um, that's uh, that's a new series that premiered uh, a couple of, couple of weeks ago. How is it? It's it's wonderful. Um, it's yeah. it's like uh, Degrassi, only way more extreme. That, mm, that, okay, that, that's <laughs> a lot more. Uh, Sex and drugs, in other words. Exactly. Yes, uh, and and also addressing you know mental mental health issues and and uh, and many things along those lines uh, that uh, that were not really brought up, but also still having that serious edge that the Grassi has, while at the same time also a little bit of levity. Um, so I'm I'm really enjoying it, and she's proven a lot to me in that. So I was very much looking forward to see what they were going to do with uh, you know Michelle Jones in this, and uh, they they blew it out of the park for me I, I she became b- so believable one of my one of my closest friends was sitting next to me the second time that i saw it and she literally squeed 
when they when they had their like their their peck kiss, <laughs> you know, near the end of the movie because it just felt so real and awkward and you know like uh, you know first kiss style you know high school action and it's it just it worked for me in so many ways. Love the Ned uh, Betty stuff, you know, harkening back to their relationship in the comics. While at the same time, also just playing it as a gag, and I'm I'm perfectly okay with that. But you know, no, Jake Gyllenhaal stole the show, and yeah. it's so nice for him to finally be in a Spider-Man movie when he came so close to being Spider-Man. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if if uh, if uh, Tobey Maguire hadn't hadn't uh, fixed his back, uh, then he probably would have been Spider-Man in Spider-Man Two, um, and it didn't turn out that way. And now here he is as the villain, and it's he, he is one of the most believable villains. I love how they worked it into previous continuity. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, es- yeah. Especially with his henchmen, you know, going all the way back to the first Spider-Man and, uh, sorry, the first, I keep saying that, uh, to the first Iron Man uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with, with Ralphie, with, with Ralphie and Stain. <laughs> um, yeah, just so many good things about this movie. And I think I do like it better than Homecoming. It's hard for me to say one way or the other. Um, well, I have a hard time with that because I loved Michael Keaton as Vulture. And that, uh. and that's the thing that's stopping me from saying 100% that I like it better. Just because, uh, just just like the, uh, the, you know, the end credits scene had me forward, I was so tense in that scene in Homecoming when, uh, you know, he's in the car. The, oh, with the gun. Oh, oh yeah. With, with the gun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, like I, I was, I, it, it was, it was one of the most tense scenes in, in in all of the Marvel Cinematic Universe for me, and and, and you know Michael Keaton's just so good in that movie. Um, but overall, I I thought Night Night Monkey was great in this, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I very much enjoyed what, what 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 had to be said. So it was good stuff. Um, yeah, but I mean, further further thoughts about it. Uh, I mean, obviously, two of the most important uh, end credit scenes. Uh, yeah. in in years if not period uh i mean you know with 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 the with the reveal at the end of uh you know now everybody knowing who peter parker is and nj jonah jameson and then the scroll reveal i mean i did not see that one coming at all <laughs> no light no. years out of left field yeah <laughs> i mean i wondered what was wrong because i didn't think that nick fury was his total self from what we've seen but yeah. i thought well he's just back doing his thing and <laughs> it's not going to be the same but yeah no i didn't i didn't see that at all i mean uh, especially with like the, the, the moment that i that i started questioning if something was wrong was uh when fury was you know i, I knew from the beginning that that he was evil and and, and he was like he had no idea uh, yeah you know because that do, that doesn't seem like something that fury would do um, yeah. and he just seemed a little bit too gullible throughout. And then to find out that it was Telos the entire time really hit that home. Yep. And, and there's an entire ship of scrolls. Like, what are we leading towards? Under Fury's <laughs> command. Under Fury's command. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Kree scroll war, uh, or secret invasion or something of the sort. I, it's, it's very hard to, te- to tell, but I am so intrigued and we don't even, uh, Captain Marvel 2 is not even on the slate. So we didn't even know when this is happening. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy one thing I want to note was that when he's caught in um, Mysterio's illusions oh, and they have like the big gauntlet hand coming out and I'm like I, I was just my mouth dropped because they clearly went to the Remedis, classic Remedis senior Mysterio story where Spider-Man's caught in this like miniaturized house that he yep. puts him in um, like they, they clearly went to those pages and I, I was just blown away with how they brought they it, you, uh, they took it from the page and they put it right in the film. Yep. Um, and and I know awesome. te- I know technology these days allows for that to be more easily done than if they ever tried it ten twenty years ago. But the the way his hallucinations were tripping Peter up that's exactly what I wanted from Mysterio. Oh, absolutely. And uh, and Mur- and Murd's right. The costume was incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. And, and and for that matter. What about Spider-Man's costume? I, I, Which I, one? Well, okay, uh, point. Uh, but uh, the, 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 his final one, the, uh, the actual, the one with the black highlights, which felt like it was like the best parts of Alex Ross's version of the movie suit and, yeah. Dick, and Ditko's original suit. Yeah, Ditko's original suit was black highlights, not blue. Yeah. Yep. 
yeah, I, I, I really dig it. I, I wasn't expecting to like it as much as I did, and it, it really worked for me. But, uh, yeah, no, I love Mysterio's costume in this. It's, it's, it's kind of, it, and it's functional. I love how he is legitimately wearing a, mul- a motion capture suit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With uh, with all the squares on it and everything, like that's that's what Hollywood actors wear. That's what Mark Ruffalo was wearing the entire time he was filming Endgame. Uh, yep. it is is that very suit? Um, and then you know the uh, to have the mysterious suit go on top of it the way that that they do with the holograms and everything is just beautifully <laughs> what rendered and 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 uh, that whole the whole the whole misdirect with Fury and and everything just worked perfectly. And they didn't wimp out. They had the fishbowl. Yeah, fishbowl. Yep. <laughs> uh, I, I have I have a page of Easter eggs up as well, but before I do that, uh, uh, Matt, I mean, you you want to touch a little bit more on on what didn't work for you? Because uh, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit of your of your gripes. <clears throat> sure. Um, it's funny. I'm just thinking back to some of the texts that I was sending to to Kevin about this, and uh, uh, just like uh, so, my biggest issue. I don't. I can't remember if I was on the homecoming review episode or not. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> For the majority of the movie, I was like, eh. Um, it wasn't until he went back to his homemade costume that I it started to feel like Spider-Man to me mm-hmm. um, because of the suit that, that Tony gave him. Uh, and best part that I, I pulled out of the first movie was Vulture. Again, in this one, if it wasn't for I, – I loved what they did with Mysterio. I would think this is even worse. Just be, I, I feel – to some extent, I feel like we're getting a shell game. Like there's there's trying to get so far away from Raimi's movies that, that they're trying to to kind of shuffle things around for you. So they they keep using MJ because they basically want you to to believe this is MJ instead of Michelle Jones. So it feels like a shell game. You know, either just pick someone else that he dated or just create this brand new character, and, and that's that's fine. That is, but don't don't try to make me believe it's MJ by continuously re- referencing it as MJ. The other thing is with Ned. Um, okay, I understand. You don't want to do redo Harry. So, I, you know, you gave me this, this Ned character, and that, that kind of goes along with, you know, what I just said about w- with MJ. But but I feel, to me, that most, because of, of Ned, I think you're getting away from his relationship with Aunt May. And... Um, w- and they really are doing dick with uh, Uncle Ben. I only saw the first <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man movie. I didn't see the sequel, but I've noticed You're in fine. that one. <laughs> it, I noticed in that one they they didn't even use "with great power comes great responsibility." In this one, they not only not use that line, they really don't even do anything with Ben. So instead, you get Tony as an Uncle Ben character. So yeah. again, this is if the third movie he's beyond Tony. It took three movies in a Spider-Man trilogy before we completely got past Tony Stark and moved on to to something different. So uh, that whole aspect irritates me because I, I like that down and out down and out uh, Parker luck where nothing ever works wor- works right. He gets just enough money for rent, but then Aunt May needs it for something, so he's still screwed. And it, it feels though he he has a golden parachute that he should not have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so those things b- bothered me. Uh, I found myself as it's going through the movie, I care less and less about his circle of friends. Uh, the, uh, now I understand reading in the comics that they would pop up, but I feel that the movie is the last two movies have put them a lot more um, into the the grand story than than I would have preferred to um, for, for them to be in. Uh, again, uh, I, I my favorite part in this has to be the initial. I never bought the Mysterio uh, was a hero and, and all that other crap. No, no. But the um, when he went to Berlin and that whole sequence, I remember Kevin hadn't seen the movie. And I said, there's one scene that made this movie for me worth seeing in the theater. And I wouldn't tell him what it is, but I said, I, I bet you'll, you'll be able to pick it out. And he, and he, he did. Because it, just seeing how everything unfolded, um, they jumped around the costumes. And even even though he got hit by a train at the end and somehow survived, it was around <laughs> that that part that kind of felt like this feels like it's spider-man but then of course he contacts ha- harry um not harry uh happy hogan happy. and then it goes um i also i cannot stand the continuous removing the mask i i don't i understand that you got to get his face up to yeah. um tom holland's face up there he's selling the movie he is spider-man 
But at the same time, I think if there's one character that you should not – has an issue with showing his face and his identity is Peter Parker because of all the repercussions, which we saw after Civil War. And now I understand it's easy for a quick thing of scrolls just pop up and, hey, it wasn't really Peter Parker that was Spider-Man. Plus the fact that they already established that the the website that, that J. Jonah Jameson is on is basically like InfoWars. So it's always easy to say, well, is this guy really credible? He supposedly has this. Um, I don't believe Mysterio's dead. I was hoping to see a little bit of something with Vulture uh, or um, Tombs in here a little mm-hmm. bit to maybe lead to something, a, a grander scheme. I'll agree but, with that. Um, uh, I don't think I don't I, think I don't think he's dead either. Honestly, and, no, I don't and, either. And I and I I was going to say that that uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, if come this next one he's involved in some way, and that the hologram tech might be Spider Man's out as well. Uh, yeah, uh, come come the uh, come the long run. Uh, the, the other thing that's starting to, to uh, well, one of the mistakes that I. That I I made was I think a day or two after I wound up watching Spider-Man, the first Raimi movie. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I I feel emotion in this movie. Like some people would say was the first Superman movie, Christopher Reed. You you feel some weight to it. I don't feel any weight to these solo MCU Spider-Man movies. They just feel like movies that I'm just sitting here watching. Um, And so that, that's kind of bothersome for me knowing that Spider-Man's kind of like my original first comic book character love um that that we've gotten to that far um the the other thing would be um that recently actually over the weekend they had um winter soldier on a couple times and uh I, and fury was so cool in there and i feel as though since captain marvel movie they're turning it to more of a a, a joke type of thing and kind of the ending with him looks as though are we going to kind of turn things now where he's not very stoic and kind of the, the serious guy in the room. Now yeah. it's just going to be like he'll be making jokes in there as well. And well, that bothers him to me as well. I think that'll stop because I think the whole point of him being that way was he took his break and when he stood up and went out and said, all right, back to work, I think that will now be the more serious Nick Fury. Yeah. That, that's what I hope. I, I, I would agree with you as well. I, I, I think uh, – I mean, I, I I get it, and and honestly, they've been they've been making him more jokey over time, as uh, I I feel like. But I'm glad, again, I'm glad that the Nick Fury that we saw in this up until that last scene was not actually Nick Fury. Yeah, yeah. I mean, although Agreed. the line "Bitch, you've been to space" was easily the best line in the, in, in, in the movie <laughs> that he had, because I mean, Sam Jackson delivering that line was priceless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought they also had a missed opportunity to maybe sneak another Spider-Man villain in there because one of his one of Fury's um, compa- um, I don't, don't want to say henchmen, but one of his um, compatriots sh- compatriots was um, I think it was Vladimir. Yes, mm-hmm. which is the first name of the chameleon. So, and I think he kind kind of came off as Russian. Uh, that would have been an interesting way to kind of sneak another person in there yeah um, so the, i was reading some rumblings that that might have been the case and when i was reading i was like because initially i was not going to see this in the theater it, it, the fact that it's the last one in the infinity saga i was like okay and then i was reading some of those other things like J. Jonah jameson might make a surprise appearance in it and mm-hmm. some other things i was like okay now i can kind of justify seeing it um but i, I think that was kind of a, a, a ball drop there that they could have taken that it, Oh, Dimitri. It's Dimitri. Why would they right. name a character? Dimitri Dimitri? Yeah. <laughs> Why? It, it seemed kind of to, to use that name and, and kind of in the whole smoke and mirrors type of theme with Mysterio that you, it, it seemed like a, a just like in Iron Man 2 where you have um, Whiplash being from Russia and then you don't have anything with Black Widow kind of having a connection there. Yeah. Um, yeah, some, something type was of thing. Like, uh, like yeah. there was there was this huge open hole, well, not hole, but like these two dots that were right next to each other. You could easily put a line across to make a connection, and you did nothing with it. You know, it's um, it's funny, funny, funny. You mentioned Spider Man Two specifically because I sorry, I, I keep doing that. Iron Man Two. I'm gonna keep doing that every <laughs> single time. I, I you mentioned Iron Man Two. Uh, that uh, I've had people uh, compare this to Iron Man Three uh, in in plot 
uh, you know, build. Just for the fact that, you know, Spider-Man is is having issues with being a hero and, and he's having, you know, like anxiety and all that jazz. And then, uh, you know, we think we have one person and it turns out to be somebody else, just similar to the whole Trevor Slattery scenario with the, with, yeah. with Mysterio and then uh, and then the battle at the end and everything. Um, so uh, with, with, with all with all these drones and what have you uh, was was a little bit similar to what we had with uh, with Iron Man three. But um, I it's hard. It's hard to make Spider Man matter immediately in a world where every single other hero has already been established. And I think that I I, I understand that uh, that some people might have a problem with uh, with him not being you know immediately the star of the MCU. But I feel well, like I, we're definitely still working up to that, and we'll I, get there. I, I would never say that. Um, I, I feel. Like in the end, there's a line here. Or it was in Infinity War that um, how how can I be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man if there's no neighborhood? Right. And I know it doesn't make sense, but you know what I mean. That that's kind of what that's kind of what I feel with with this movie is mm-hmm. he doesn't need to be the next figurehead Iron Man of the MCU moving forward. Right. He just needs to kind of be his neck of the woods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is who we. Th- this is the situation. Um, so I, I understand he's the biggest prop. I would say he's the biggest property that historically for for Marvel. So you know, of course, if you have control of it, because now it crossed over a billion dollars. So I guess they continue to to uh, Marvel Studios continues to have some type of control with regard to the forthcoming appearances. That, that you want him to be a staple, but it just, it just doesn't seem like you need to. You you can do. You don't have to isolate him to his own. Sphere where it doesn't affect anything else, but but I, it just I, I don't know. It just if it, it doesn't feel like the character I remember reading, right? I guess it feels like the little bit of Ultimate Spider-Man that I read that never felt like Spider-Man to me either. That's what I feel like we're getting with the with the MCU version of the character. And 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 see that that's where our div- that's where our divide is because I, you know. I started reading Spider-Man comics in the 90s and the Clone Saga and all that jazz. And for me, the ultimate Spider-Man was a, a breath of fresh air. And in some ways, like, I hadn't I hadn't really read this, the Silver Edge stuff. So that was my real first, like, this is how Spider-Man started version. And, mm-hmm. and I was able to se- I was able to separate the two because I mean I was I was reading Spider-Man comics, you know, regularly at Marvel. It's just that because of where I came in. Ultimate Spider-Man was a great foot in the door um, for for my reading. You know, it was only, it was only the year two thousand. Like I, I'd been reading comics for like ten years at that point. Um, Ian, let me ask you: Have you ever gone back and read any of the Spidey Silver Age stories? I've I've read a little bit. I've read a little bit. Yeah, and, and I've enjoyed what I've read. I just definitely need to still read more. And uh, one of these days, I'm just okay. going to sit my butt down uh, and, and do. Well, no, know, I, I, I I'm glad read. you've mentioned this because. We'll talk about this later on, but I have a, an idea for something that I'd like us to do in the show in the future involving those Spider-Man Silver Age stories. Sure, yeah. And I think your participation in that as a as a newcomer to it would be invaluable. Absolutely. So yeah. we'll talk about that in the planning session. Oh, yeah. No, sure. Definitely. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. It would give me a reason yeah. to sit down on, on Unlimited for a weekend and just read nothing but that. Yep. Well, and and as as far as, as the way Spider-Man feels, I do miss the weight that uncle ben gave peter i do think that is missing yes I would but agree. i also don't need an entire origin story again oh my god yes <laughs> well, don't, don't, they they show, need... don't they show a suitcase with ben's initials on it they do well, yeah, that's, they do. that's his dad's i thought yeah. no, no no it's his no um, it's his. B, it is his father's name was richard not ben yeah. Richards. Yeah. okay yeah i, I don't i don't want another origin i think you can kind of i, I think you can you can have him be a part of Without actually doing a, a, a shit, a whole uh, thing. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't. It's yeah. been a while since I saw the show. I don't know how much we can swear, but a, a, a backlog of uh, of flashbacks and stuff like that. I think you could have a picture of him on Aunt May. I think they could talk about him a little bit more, and yeah. and, and just those little things will give the character weight. That you know, I, I feel like this Peter. A lot of who he is is because of Tony Stark, mm. uh, as opposed to. Uh, Uncle Ben, there was uh, the that, that great mini series that Jamie got got me at, um, got me for me when we were talking about a little bit uh, bullet points, and it was the whole thing that if Erskine got killed before giving the the serum to to Steve Rogers, mm-hmm. how that had um, trickling down effect. Yep. And one of the people who got 
killed in that was Ben Parker when he was young um, in the military. And because of that, Peter never had Uncle Ben there after his parents died as, as this uh, as this role, role model. Mm-hmm. And then he kind of went on to be um, like a, a rebel. And then, you know, I won't get too far into the story, but he, he, he definitely was not the guy that we knew with great power, and great responsibility because yep. Uncle Ben was never there to teach it. To some extent, I feel like we're kind of getting both fat. We're, we're getting uh, Tony Stark is supplementing Uncle Ben. So you're getting some of it, but you're not getting the full effect of what Ben yeah. brought Peter. And I think you don't need to do an origin story. You don't need to have all these flashbacks, but you can reference him um, periodically in there to show how important Ben was mm-hmm. and how important his death was to make. Because at this point, everyone knows the origin. So yeah. even if you make those references, you know what happened to Uncle Ben. The majority of people, I'll say, know what happened. Well, we know what uh, originally happened to Uncle Ben the first time around. But you know these things go through uh, different uh, minor tweaks uh, in each iteration, and I think... Every time a new iteration happens, some groundwork needs to be laid in the form of an origin story. I'll agree that we don't need a full movie, 50% of the running time of which is just given over to laying that foundation. But I think maybe a couple minutes worth of screen time in flashbacks would be sufficient. And as far as Uncle Ben goes, I've got a theory about that. I think these filmmakers are just shameless enough to have Uncle Ben show up alive in the third movie. Oh. And we'll learn that uh, he didn't die. Instead, he walked out on May and Peter about 10 years ago. When he was still a kid. Oof. I, wow. I really hope that you're wrong, Adam. Yeah, I, hope <laughs> I, do, yeah, well. I do too. I do too, wow. Shane, but I would not put it past these people. Yeah. Wow. However, what, what, what I— What do you mean these people? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> However— in my in my mind, if Marissa Tomei is Aunt May, why can't Toby Maguire be Ben? <laughs> oh, well, there was talk Steve about that. Shimmy. Oh, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> they really want to demythify demythify Uncle Ben and his <laughs> his benevolent, uh, well, benign influence on Peter's life. Yeah, that, that that would be a way to go. How goes it, young kids? <laughs> there was talk about Shemmy to play Uncle Ben as a weasel. I, I think somewhere along the line, Tom Holland said he would love that idea if Tobey Maguire came back. I mean, he's got yeah. lots of time; he's just doing poker now. But um, <laughs> that he would he would play Uncle Ben. Does anyone else feel that having Marissa Tomei as Aunt May is being wasted? Like she got even yeah. less yeah. screen time in this one than the the first one. I would agree. Yeah, with you. yeah. I, I thought she'd be in a little bit more this time. Yeah. Well, cause she's, she's such a great actress and such a great sort of twist on that character that I, I yeah. agree. Yeah. I'd love to see them do more with that character. Next, next yeah, movie, absolutely. next movie. I think when he has fewer people to rely on, I think I think that May is going to have a much larger presence. Um, or at least that's what I'm hoping, uh, because <laughs> because I, th- I think there's only so many people that Spider Man is going to be able to trust in the next movie, and uh, that that may mean a, a larger screen presence for uh, for May. But uh, I, I'm also thinking that I'm trying to think of what the next movie would be called because it's got to have home in there somewhere. Um, so maybe like Spider-Man Homeless, perhaps, uh, if he's unable to go, to go home or No Way Home or uh, Home is Where the Heart Is or something like that. Uh, they, well, yeah. I'm also hoping, and I'm not a direct piggyback, Ian, but I just thought of this. In, in the teaser scene in the first film, they clearly established that we might see a Sinister Six. Yes. Because... Yeah. Mm-hmm. The vulture meets the scorpion in the prison. Yep. And so I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, they got to return to that. I, I mean, the, so I, I'm interested to see if they're going to bring in other villains. And again, I mean, being the Spider Man fan that I am, I do want to see them do a version of Norman Osborne at some point. Yes. Um, but it, again, it has to work in this new version yeah, they've established. So- Okay, so speaking of Norman Osborn, first, first the title of the third one. I thought "Home Sweet Home," but I don't know mm. if that would work so well. Yeah, it could. About Homeland um, Security. <laughs> yeah, you know, that way. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, as far as Norman Osborn, so here, here's where I will be disappointed if at the end of Homecoming you find out that Tony sold Stark Towers, Avengers Towers, to Norman Osborn, I'll be disappointed. Right from the moment that I saw that part in Homecoming, I thought it should go to Reed Richards to bring him into the MCU. Yeah. Well, they 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 did they did have signs up, uh, uh, and uh, in that mo- in the movie that were something along the lines of you know something big is coming, 
and it was counting up, and it was like one, two, three, and okay. that, and that was around where Avengers Tower was. Okay, that's what I'm hoping. Well, yeah, I I just was reading something that there's there's hints that maybe they're gonna retcon Fantastic Four as being he have, having been here before, but trapped in like the negative zone. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, which is fine. Like they which, did with Carol yeah. Danvers, in other words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would perfectly fine with me. That's definitely plausible. The, I, I mean, between the new properties that that Marvel has, they're the easiest ones. Yeah. To introduce, I mean, the yeah. X Men alone could take ten years to get them, you know, really indoctrinated into where we are. If you're going to hit all the major characters, for, yeah. unless you just do one, well, I, they could just do one movie. But um, I, I think w- with Nor- see, I think in the next phase, what I'd like to, see, or the next saga that they do, if they introduce Norman, I'd like to see him be. They they kind of did this with the counts after a while, made him basically Lex Luthor. Of, mm-hmm. of of Marvel, yeah. Um, it doesn't have to, to oversee Shield, but I like to see him have more of this uh, this front th- th- this presence. Maybe not so much as Green Goblin because we we kind of already seen that. I'd also like yeah. to see if they do Fantastic Four Doom. I I, I kind of oh, like oh, to yeah. see like it, it it could be another Thanos le- level threat without being you know cosmic. Um, do himself. I mean, there's so much wealth of, of a character in there if, if done properly. Oh yeah, that, yeah. That, that he could be the next guy that everyone's building towards. Right, especially supposedly, you know, there's this big dream of doing the Secret Wars. That this is the Secret War saga, um, <laughs> introducing the Beyonder and stuff like that. Oh boy. Um, but but uh, I digress. As, as long as long as they don't have to teach the Beyonder how to pee, then uh, yeah. then we're then we're good. <laughs> Three things because uh, you just made me rethink this when it comes to Norman. They kind of – the way they, they used Michael Keaton's interpretation of the vulture in Homecoming, there was a bit of a Norman Osborn edge to that because mm-hmm. he knows Peter's identity and they kind of – like that scene in the car you referenced, Dean, which I agree was absolutely mm-hmm. uh, outstanding. Yeah. Th- there's that, that tension there and, and that – because they know each other's secrets. So – they may i'm i'm just totally you know shooting in the wind here but they may be they may kind of use the vulture as an osborne type character i don't know i i would i would love to see you know norman osborne and let me say say this about the goblin <clears throat> yes willem dafoe was a great norman osborne but that was not a great green goblin because oh, ridiculous that's true. i so, know god that that test of of what the goblins who could have looked like oh my god that would have been brilliant well you mean the alex ross design well, whatever it was, they had an animatronic yes. mask that fit over mm-hmm. Willem Dafoe, yep. and it looked fantastic. It well, the, the, what what they have to do, if they ever bring the Goblin back, and now since effects have jumped even further since that mm-hmm. that first Raimi film, they have to create an outfit where, and it's, I think it's kind of what you're referencing there, Shane, where you know that it's a man, because that makes it all the more terrifying, because you see how completely insane he is. Yeah. And whereas Defoe, I thought was tremendous Norman Osborn. Like when he flips out in that boardroom, I was like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But when he put that silly helmet on. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you couldn't see anything. You don't get a sense of the, the madness. And like the, the teeth have to be his teeth and his eyes. And if, if they do the costume right, he'll be terrifying. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and the third thing I wanted to say uh, in keeping with that, with Doc, because Matt mentioned Dr. Doom. Whenever they do this Fantastic Four film, we have yet to see Doctor Doom done properly. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they get the right actor and just go to the source material, just go to what Brubaker did with his Book of Doom, and it, it, it'll just burn the house down. I mean it, it's all there. And since how they've done most of these characters well up to this point, I'm, I'm optimistic for that. Well, well, I do have to say – I'm sure you guys touched upon it on the first half when you talk about San Diego Con. Disney Plus, the fact that they not only have these movies, that they have TV series that that are going to be interconnected, mm-hmm. that that this is what I always was hoping S.H.I.E.L.D. would have been, that would be bridging kind I of agree. like the Avenger movies. Yeah. They, they could do this. So they could subtly start putting stuff in there to build the background of Doom before they actually introduce him. Yeah. Good point. Um, Good point, or, or even like the Fantastic Four, you have a couple movies, hey, they're back. Um, and then like, uh, you know, little sprinkles of who they were that by the time they do a movie, you don't necessarily have to do the whole origin all over again. 
hopefully people had seen everything building up in in, in everything you know in the in the shows and other movies to get to where we are. Uh, so I mean, you basically could do ongoing uh, mid and post credit credit scenes building up towards what's coming next through through these series it, it's it's gonna be amazing i'm hoping it looks to be amazing so t- touching on touching on the osbournes uh there was a bit of an easter egg uh in in this far from home movie that one of the places that uh peter swings by with mj is the penthouse they used for the osbournes in the okay. Raimi films um, oh really? Yeah. Okay. Which which makes you know again which uh, immediately makes people think oh is that where they're heading for the next one? It might might have just been an Easter egg, but who knows? The other thing is now that we've been talking about it, I cannot get the idea of Brian Cranston as Norman Osborn out of my head. <laughs> oh wow! And oh wow! I well, and clutch casting. Yeah, uh, I think I think he would be amazing in the role. You know what I could kind of see them do is it's presumably with Tony dead, there's a power vacuum with what he brought. I mean, I know Peppa's overseeing, but could Norman essentially be take over, take fill in that void while in the mm. meantime, organizing all this stuff behind the scenes? Yeah. So that, you know, we're, we're building to something pretty decent. But but that's kind of I mean, if they're going to continue with what they've been doing with Tony, you could have Norman kind of coming in there. I'm not Partnering. necessarily be, yeah, just like, hey, you know, I'd like to, with the death of this great hero, I want to step in here and do what he's able yeah. to do. I don't have a suit, so I'll be more, you know, almost like a politician type of aspect to it. And and um, hey, and hey, they're they're introducing Zemo again, so the yes. idea of of a of a Marvel Plus Thunderbolt series with 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 Norman as the as the you know the man you know orchestrating everything Dark Avenger style. Mm. So, so Iron Patriot in the office. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, I, I did hear a rumor that the next Avengers movie is going to be Dark Avengers. Ooh. That some of the stuff is building toward toward that. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. It's a possibility. Um yeah. I've got I've got some Easter eggs I want to throw out there for you guys Jeez. real quick. Uh, so, uh, in the background of the fundraiser scene, uh, where uh, you know MJ, uh, so, sorry, where uh, where May and uh, and Peter were uh, were at the beginning of the movie, there was a uh, there was a, a a poster in the background for a wrestling match between yeah. between Crusher yep. Hogan. I saw that. Yep. 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 And uh, um, what's his name from the Raimi movie? Yeah. Was the undercard. Yes. Uh, Bonesaw is the ready. Bonesaw, right? Bonesaw McGraw. <laughs> Bonesaw McGraw. <laughs> yep. And there, there, there were pretty much every single license plate in the movie was a reference to something. Um, mm. uh, there were, there were almost all references to Amazing Spider-Man, uh, uh, you know, issues that the characters, uh, you know, were, were a part of, uh, including uh, at one point I think uh, when Sam Jackson first shows up. As Nick Fury, uh, they reference uh, the issue of Amazing Spider-Man where Nick Fury and uh, and Spider-Man team up. So that was pretty cool. Um, and and what did you guys think of the elementals? We haven't really touched on that. Uh, that uh, you know, this is essentially the MCU's version of Sandman, Hydro Man, and uh, uh, Molten Man. And, and Molten Man, yeah. I mean, yeah. That... went so far as to mention Morris Bench's name. Yep. <laughs> And, and and it being an internet rumor, I, I, could, I couldn't help but laugh at that. Yes. <laughs> Flash bringing that up and being wrong about it as usual. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, they're, 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 they're just big special effects, both uh, within the story and without it, yep. and uh, well-rendered ones. Um, one of my favorite scenes of the movie is actually the one where Mysterio is working with his team to construct uh, yeah. the illusion. Yeah. I find yeah. one of those things. That's that's a really neat little I, – I was mildly disappointed that they didn't work in some throwaway reference to Quentin Beck having worked in Hollywood before he went to work for Stark. But when I saw that scene, I realized that was just in and of itself a little micro satire of the uh, collaborative Hollywood storytelling movie-making process. And that, that was really all the Hollywood background that this Quentin Beck needed. It was just a sweet little scene. Yeah, <laughs> and and the other thing, of course, is the uh, is the throwaway. Uh, well, not throwaway, but uh, the reference to uh, Earth six one six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, of course, immediately oh, the minute that he said that, I'm like, okay, so this is going to be bullshit because there's no way that they're going to establish that the cinematic universe is six one six because we all yeah, know which right. one is six one six. 
<laughs> Thank you, look, Ian. Look, look for those license plate scenes. I totally missed that. Yeah, I yep. missed the yeah. license plates. Yeah. There were a few that began with the number, uh, the letters A M S. Yep, and and those and those are the ones that uh, that are the queer references. There's there's a there's a uh, uh, a really really good uh, uh, Far From Home Easter eggs post. Um, that uh, uh, that was made by uh, a, f- a fellow podcaster, actually. Um, uh, I think for the Hollywood Reporter, if I remember correctly. Um, that uh, that he winds up doing it. Dan Dan Gavazdin is the guy's name, um, and he and he actually has a Spider-Man podcast uh, of his own, and he writes uh, Easter egg articles for every Spider-Man movie that comes out now, um, and he's got fifty of them. And, oh, wow! Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, including like the four thirty six license plate that I mentioned with uh, with Nick Fury, because that's a uh, reference back to uh, Amazing Spider Man uh, uh, number four back in nineteen sixty three. Uh, you got Mysterio references out the wazoo. So many, so many other things to throw out there, including references to Mike Piazza and the Mets. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's uh, it's well worth reading that at the Hollywood Reporter. Uh, the name of the article is uh, is the definitive list of Spider-Man Far From Home references and Easter eggs. So go, sure. you guys can go ahead and cool. check that out. All right, any anything else uh, to reference other than uh, than uh, I will always love you, starting off the uh, the movie and being absolutely <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess Black Widow finally got her uh, funeral mention that people were complaining about from Endgame. <laughs> oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. By uh, by by teenagers using Getty images. Yeah, I uh, I, I was watching. I don't know if anyone saw this. Day. So Sam Raimi ha- is producing a movie that's out right now, Crawl. And in an interview, they asked him if he saw the new Spider-Man movie, which he said he had. But he said, "Did you know that?" You know, J.K. is back as J. Jonah Jameson. He mm-hmm. said, "Yeah, actually, J.K. called to see if it would be, basically would it would be okay." Yeah, and he said, "I love Spider-Man. I love J.K." So of course, I said yes. And the the interviewers like the roar of of uh, cheers that that when they saw who who it was and who was playing it again, just was loud in the theater. And he goes, "Really?" He goes, "I'm so glad to hear that." And uh, I kind of felt the same uh, again. I heard rumblings that he was going to make an appearance and the jk simmons was actually at the premiere so i was like oh that would be kind of but um although the the new look kind of throws me off yeah uh, a bit a little bit yeah um but but that was that was kind of neat i I thought it was classy of jk to reach out to sam raymond say hey you know they were asking me what kind of would it be okay yeah um, type of thing but that'd that'd be great Yeah. yeah The the other the other two things uh, uh Jason Aiello uh you know who would who played a uh, uh uh a small part in this but he was one of the anchors uh first appeared in the Untold Tales of Spider-Man number 2. Right. Uh mm-hmm. so that's good to see him and then Brad uh-huh. Davis was in Amazing Spider-Man 188. Uh the you know the character that uh, that had aged 5 years who uh, who was uh you know the uh comp- competition for Peter for right. MJ. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> total romantic comedy stock character. Him, he was just there. His sole function was to be a speed bump between Spider Man and MJ. He yep. Was, did, did you guys find the teachers to be unnecessary? I love them. I honestly comedy love them. relief. Yeah. I, I yeah, just, yeah, just comedy relief. Yeah, it's just very fun. <laughs> My, I, I don't know. After a while, I was just like, okay, we get the joke, you know, of, of what's going on. I, I don't know. Again, I mean, not to. Go over yet. I, I just that side of the movies I, I'm not too interested in. I think they put too much time when I'd rather s- want to see the other stuff with, with Spider Man. I, I thought my wife Martin I thought, Star was in Freaks and Geeks. He gets a pass for that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Exactly. I never saw that series. I thought my wife left me in the blip. Tur- <laughs> you know, turns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that I love that because that is the most leftovers the show got. Because uh, immediately I thought of uh, in in the show the leftovers. Uh, the the guy who played uh, uh, Larry on Perfect Strangers, uh, faked, yeah. faked Mark Lynn Baker. Yes, Mark Lynn Baker faked his death uh, in in the world of the leftovers because every other cast member of the of of Perfect Strangers disappeared, and 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 he felt left out. So he just went, <laughs> <laughs> and it then comes up again as a plot point. I won't spoil how, but it's uh, one of my favorite moments in the in the show, The Leftovers. <laughs> that's a, that sounds kind of like um, Zombieland, how Bill Murray oh, pops up God. and he was like, uh, he was yeah. trying to be dead so he could still go golfing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's such a good movie. Oh, and uh, what if Mr. Negative is our next villain? Uh, 
Can they use classic ones? I mean, they could, yeah. they, they they certainly. I'd rather could. see some classic ones again. The, yeah. The only reason I th- I I even suggest that is because Feast is mentioned uh, you know prominently in the movie, and and uh, that was you know Mister Negative's whole bag. So they could just be using that as a, uh, you know, as as a charity, or he could be, you know, next in the corner. But who knows? But considering how well they rendered Mysterio's costume, hmm. I'd love to see more of the classic villains. Oh yeah, um, and, and how they interpret them. Definitely, Craven, Craven, please, Craven, Craven. Yes, I always thought, and I uh, it irritates me now. I can't remember who the guy who was who played Deuce. Uh, the, the Gigolo and Deuce Bigelow, male Gigolo, and he was uh, in the Mummy movies, the first two. Uh, he's an Israeli actor. Um, oh, oh, it irritates me. He looks exactly like Craven. Okay, I th- I, I uh, know I know who you mean. Oh, I know who you mean. Yeah, I know who you okay. mean. Okay, because when when yeah, back with Raimi doing, it, I was like, this would be the perfect guy to play Craven. He looks yeah. exactly like the goatee and everything is is perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. And right? if we have Craven, his half brother, the chameleon, could uh, yep. follow along in his uh, ah, in his shadow as usual. Yeah, it, and yeah. I, I saw this when it first came out. So forgive me, my memory. Did we see the scene where he's taking down the gang in the uh, the Chinese restaurant, or was that no? Just that, in the... that wasn't in the movie. Yeah. That was just okay. in the trailer. Because I know on the DVD release they're going to do that, like Peter's Adventure or something like that. Where yeah. Get the... yep. But anyways, the the villain in there was a hint that it was Silvermane. Mm. Oh wow! That it was a character that he that you see um, get caught up in the web that you like, he has some type of a weird outfit or it might've been a woman, but they said <laughs> the, the name reference is a callback to Silvermane is like, could that actually be the character huh. uh, that got maybe just made as a female as opposed to a, a male. Yeah. But by the way, the actor you're thinking of is Oded fair. Yes. Yes. He also did the voice of Dr. Fate in the justice this league. Is, oh yes. There yes. I would I would actually be perfectly okay with him playing Craven. I, he he yeah. certainly he certainly has the look. So uh, yes, mm. yeah, hey, he's a good actor. I like yeah, the stuff that I fine see. patrician profile, the aquiline nose. Yep. Yeah, just give him the the uh, the Van Dyke, and he, he's he's good to go. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any uh, final thoughts, gentlemen? Let's 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 rank it. Let's rate it. All right, rank it up. Uh, Chris, what do you give it? Uh. Four to five freaking swears. All righty. Uh, Murd? Uh, three and a half, three and three quarters. The needle is wobbling somewhere in that area. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's swinging in one direction, and then it's swinging in the other. <laughs> thwip. Thwip, thwip, yeah. Matt? I'll give it a three. Okay. Shane? Four, four and a half. Yeah, it's 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 a four. It's a solid four out of five for me. Uh, Freaking swears. Uh, I I would have given it slightly slightly less, but those end credit scenes completely boosted it. Up, boosted it and blew it away. And mm. I, it may, it, honestly, in future view- viewings, it might even be four point two five for me because it's oh. yeah, it's it, it's <laughs> well, it's pretty damn good. Don't get your hopes t- up too much for the third one, though, because if there's one thing this movie proved, it's that these filmmakers are not that great at uh, executing the setup from previous movies. Yeah. Witness the blip, witness Aunt May suddenly being just fine with Peter being Spider-Man with no fallout, etc. Well, he has to think, I mean, I know we're looking to wrap up here. Th- this character, unfortunately, is running into this, and maybe some of the other characters we'll find as well, is running into this. So they did um, Ant-Man and the Wasp. I remember the director saying this movie isn't a sequel to Ant-Man. It's, in effect, a sequel to Ant-Man and Civil War because right. Ant-Man appeared in that. So you figure – you're right, Adam. They didn't pick up any of those threads that they had laid before. But since Homecoming came out, which picked up from Civil War, this has had um, Infinity War and Endgame to kind of pick up the thread from. So – by the time they get to a third one, there might be another couple movies that Spire makes an appearance of. So, you know, what what threads could the third solo movie directly pick up on? Well, does it have to? Well, they have to touch on things from this movie, but there might be something bigger in those other movie or two that Spider Man shows up on that they also have to run with. That maybe um, because just it becomes as important. So the stuff from this kind of gets left aside. So to some extent. You know, you're, you're screwed, I guess, because you want to pick up these threads, but there's a, something else that it's, yeah, know. in between, yeah, right. That's what you're saying, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think that, 
Um, I'm, I'm also kind of hoping that John Francis Daly comes back for the third one to co-write the script, uh, just because uh, I, I, I loved him in Freaks and Geeks, and I actually really like him as a, as a writer. Um, so maybe that would help things along in the third one a little bit more. Um, but, uh, cause I know he was not a part of the full far from home, uh, uh, script writer team. Cause I think he was busy with, ob- with other obligations. Um, so who knows? Do, do you think there's a chance that we'll see either Venom in the next one or Tom Holland, Spider-Man in the Venom movie, I, which I still haven't seen, but, uh, I don't think there's we're been talks. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we're seeing him in the next Spider-Man movie. I don't think it's happening. I, no, I, I don't think so either. Yeah. So I, I think they're just going to completely keep them separate. Well, I kind of hope not because it, it saddens me that you have Venom without Spider-Man, but I think there's a better chance of Spider-Man showing up in a Venom movie than the other way around. Yeah. yeah and it might not be Tom Holland playing the character. In oh, very case. true. Yeah. Very true. That's a, that's an excellent point because, uh, before, you know, before we're done with, with this conversation, um, if this movie hadn't have made a billion dollars, the rights would have fully reverted back to Sony. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. That was that was in the contract that with the sequel, if it was not able to make a billion dollars worldwide, then Sony would have gotten full rights back to the character and they would have been able to do whatever they wanted with it without input from uh, from Marvel from this point. I'm through. assuming yeah. it made a billion dollars. It very much Yeah, did. it's over. It actually is now higher than Aquaman that I saw. But, you know, it's two X, uh, the X-Files music, the conspiracy theory could be, did Disney, you know, buy some some tickets, more or less, to make sure that I can. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's Cause, possible. Because that's one of the theories that I, I've recently was reading about with the Captain Marvel movie, mm-hmm. that to get that over a billion dollars to beat out what Wonder Woman did, yeah. um, did Disney play a hand in that? So, you know, this would this would easily make, I'm not saying it did happen, but this would easily be something I could foresee a company that wants to keep access to a character and control, you know, um, stuff in the ballot a little bit. So yeah. Also, there was another shooter on the grassy knoll. But uh, I'm just saying. (laughs) Actually, I have have a quick question because I I don't know if we ever talked about this or maybe I wasn't present. Was the Venom movie good? I didn't see it. Um, Well, (laughs) I've heard it was good. I didn't see it. (laughs) Okay, but it made me buy it. I haven't watched it yet, but I do have it because I had so many other people that I trust like it. And (laughs) they said towards the end, it was really surprising and something happens. I'm like, okay. So now I'm intrigued. My younger son was asking about it, so I got it so that we could watch it sometime. Shane, I'll, uh, what I'll say about it is, uh, and I, I think I said this on Comic Timing at one point when it, when we were first uh, you know discussing the movie right mm-hmm. when it first came out, that if if Venom had came out around the time that the Daredevil movie came out, it would have been great because <laughs> it is a mid it is a mid two thousand superhero movie. Okay, okay. I understand. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like in- and it's a late 20 teens B picture creature feature. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's very much in that ilk. Like it don't don't expect, you know, reinventing the wheel or anything like that. Go into it expecting a movie that is off the rails insane at times and doesn't even exactly know where it's going. Mm-hmm. And yet, <laughs> and yet there are moments when it's not insane enough, I would argue. Yes. It, it pulls back from some of the really gruesome brain-eating violence that one might expect from a Venom feature film. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Right. And and the and the end credits scene, I'm not spoiling anything, but I'll just say it's one of the worst wigs I've ever seen on a human being. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's that's all I'll say about the Venom movie. And uh, if if they do decide to introduce Spider Man, I'm actually in Murd's camp. I'd rather it just be somebody else playing the character and just have it be a separate universe, like what DC seems to be doing with their mm-hmm. movies and Joker and all that jazz. Just keep it far away from the MCU, and I'll be a happy camper. Okay, I guess ideally you would just have to get a guy in a suit, just you know, call him Parker. You never have to if he never removes his mask yeah. or enough that you would see his face. You'd have no idea. <laughs> Wouldn't it be hilarious if they get Andrew Garfield and they just go ahead and just like say? <laughs> going to say that it's still Sony. Why not give Garfield another crack at it? Oh boy! No, I, I saw an interview with him that basically said that movie broke him. Oh, I so can imagine. I, I don't the think second one or the first one? Uh, by the second one, he realized it's this great interview that it was like actors on actors with Amy Adams, and they were talking about that whole universe. And basically, he, the it's a different type of movie where it seemed like more, if I recall correctly from the, uh, the the conversation, they were more concerned with building the world and actually being character driven. And once he started to realize what was going on, it just started to weigh on him. 
and and he just describes it as you know it, it was a it broke him it, it opened his eyes to some the way things some things work um so he says he doesn't regret that experience but at the same time it it, it broke him of of what he wanted to do um as an actor with yeah. movies so they, they also he was, he was probably weighed down by that terrible script in the second movie. Oh my God, <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard. There was also yeah. there was also a situation where he apparently backed out of a uh, of an appearance at a meeting at Sony, um, where like they flew him out to Japan and he was sick and and you know canceled on them, and Ooh. that was apparently the day they canceled Amazing Spider Man three. Like that was really? that was apparently the last straw. Or one of them. Uh, I've heard that mentioned in uh, in I think that might have actually been in the Sony leaks, where hmm. where that was like one of the straws that broke the camel's back on on them continuing that franchise or doing something else. So who knows what happened there? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, before we wrap up entirely, uh, Mert, I, I know you went to go you you went to go see a movie uh, in in the theaters uh, that uh, that uh, I, I wanted you to touch on real quick. Uh, you got to see the release the re release of the Muppet movie. Ah, uh, yes, 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 because it's the 40th anniversary of the release of that, and uh, it's one of those uh, forum events that uh, happen you know, in a, on like a syndicated basis at theaters around the country. Uh, there happened to be one in Mays Landing, New Jersey, which is a little less than an hour's drive north of where I am down here in Stone Harbor, so I uh, took a day off this week uh, to go and take that in. Um and the movie, of course, is just as great as we all know it is. Uh, it was kind of exciting to see it on the big wide screen because the only way I've ever seen it is uh, in a uh, formatted for your TV screen version. Oh. Uh, it's one of those uh, homemade video cassettes that my dad made for me. Uh, he recorded it from a CBS telecast, uh, Christmas time, 1982. Wow. Yeah, so it's got lots of great 80s commercials on it. And I've always been kind of worried that. Uh, uh, maybe some things had been cut for running time for that broadcast, but uh, retroactive commendations go to the CBS network of 1982 because having seen the whole thing on the big screen now, I can verify that CBS cut nothing out of that telecast. Oh, nice. I've been missing nothing all these years. But I did get to see some, you know, the, there's the whole pan and scan thing to take into account. They had to trim down the, the right and left margins of the original print to fit it onto a square TV screen. So there are details that I noticed in uh, the Muppet movie I'd never seen before. Like, I finally got my first good look at uh, Dr. Bunsen Honeydew's four-foot prune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What got me, though, is at the theater where I went to see this thing, they did nothing whatsoever to promote it. Ah. There were no posters, no signage, the little electronic uh, bill of attractions behind the box office that shows you what's showing. It didn't even mention the Muppet movie. Oh. The only reason I knew it was there was because I looked it up on Fandango. And I went there because of that. And then when it came time to actually start the show, you know, raw film, raw film. Uh, somebody forgot to go into the production. Apparently they weren't even, even the staff forgot that this was happening uh. because we all, <laughs> there were like 25 of us there to see this thing, including like seven or eight kids. And we just sat there looking at a blank movie screen for 10 minutes after, you know, the usual prepackaged uh, previews and advertisements and stuff had played themselves to the end and, the screen just went dark, and we sat there for 10 minutes with nothing until somebody went out to the lobby to complain. Uh, and then finally, they gave us our, our Muppet movie. But huh. yeah, so that's this particular theater in uh, Mays Landing, New Jersey, was not really on board with this form event, and that was a little disappointing. A also, Adam, the, the, the sound was coming out of what sounded like a single set of speakers at the front of the auditorium. Oh, wow. I mean, it wasn't even in stereo. That cost me a pretty penny to do that to you the other day. <laughs> yeah, ain't you a stinker? <laughs> See, and that and that's disappointing because the few times that I've done fathom fathom events uh, uh, type things, it's like uh, there's been like you know posters that they've given out, or there've been like you know little trivia things beforehand, and uh -huh. it's it's sad to see that uh, that that's not the case at every single one of them, and that some of them are just go on like without ceremony. That's, that's well, man. let's see. Superman was like that when we saw it, and well, we did get an animated uh, short. Oh, we Max did. Fletcher we did. Studio. That You're was... right. You're right. We did. I feel didn't Bat Keaton's Batman, or I should say Burton's Batman, that was out for the anniversary as well. And the yeah, I miss, I miss I miss both of those, but those. I feel as though they didn't get any press. 
No, no. Yeah. I barely knew that they were there. And I, I had planned to go see this, but I just couldn't make it work. But there was very little other than seeing it when I was looking to buy tickets for some other movie that I see. Oh, my God, wait, the Muppets 40th anniversary. What's that? But there was no <laughs> other advertising until like the day of the day before that I started seeing it on TV or radio or something. You, mm. you know, it's. A, I mean, I know we're looking to wrap up, but because I think Die Hard came out, too, for yeah. a, for for i wonder why they're not promoting these more because I, you figure i don't know like i would love to have seen die hard's my favorite christmas movie i'd love oh. to have to see that <laughs> in the theater I, I i didn't i was too young to see it then you you, um, you would love this t-shirt that i that i got uh last last christmas matt i got a, i got a greetings from nakatomi plaza like uh, oh. uh, uh <laughs> and it has it has the uh the ad for the christmas party on it basically uh it, it's but there there'd be certain movies that if i saw i mean i, mean, I missed out on halloween the, the the original one um, from seventy eight when when that came back in the theaters for a limited run I, I don't understand why they're not really advertised that much or they okay. do an extremely li- limited run like a day or two you yeah. think at least a weekend or or two weekends so I'm on the website that I would normally go on to look for for movies when I go to buy tickets and I won't mention it because they're I don't want to do that to them um, on the website when you scroll scrolling through tickets it's when Harry met Sally's thirtieth anniversary it is Aliens' 40th anniversary, The Ooh. Shawshank Redemption's 25th, Star Trek The Motion Picture's 40th. Uh, let's see. Lawrence of Arabia from 1962. Oh. Oh. Um, a Boy Named Charlie Brown. Hello, Dolly's 50th anniversary. Yep. Uh, a 10th anniversary for Doctor Who, The End of Time. I Love Lucy, A Colorized uh, Celebration. Uh, let's see. They're 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 doing uh, uh, showings of uh, Millennium Actress and uh, and uh, My Neighbor Totoro in theaters as part of Fathom Events as well. Right. Mm. I have um, The Godfather, nineteen seventy two, coming at some point. Back to the Future, Goonies, Jaws, Snoopy Comes Home, all of those listed, but no advertising. Star, like Tra- I... Star Trek: The Motion Picture, fortieth anniversary, September fifth and September eighteenth. Wow. Yep. Yep. I only have September 18th on mine. But yeah. yeah. So they're, they're, I agree. I don't know why they're not promoting these things more. I mean, I know people find them because when, when we go, there's people in these theaters. But I would think that they would warrant more than just a day of showing two days. Yeah. That that part's a little disappointing. I think it's I think it's whatever can whatever whatever Fathom can can manage because I do not because Fathom Events is an independent company. So mm-hmm. I think they need to actually, you know, go to the theaters and rent out the theater and then make their money back. So they don't want to, you know, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to overextend wind up, themselves. Exactly, overextend themselves and then wind up having getting, you know, nothing wind up happening in the end. Yeah. Um, I would okay. think e- even if, uh, so, so Adam, I don't know what preview you saw, if they were for new movies, but w- just kind of show, hey, these are the other anniversary movies that are, that are going to be coming out this year. And then even if you just put the month, at least then. People going to see one would have an idea of, hey, this yeah. is what's coming out this year. And you don't have, you know, if you don't want to advertise beyond that, you already got people in the seats, and there could be at least some people of word of mouth going, hey, you know what? I'd love to see Jaws in the theater. Yeah, I didn't see it there. Well, you know, that's that's why I saw Star Trek Two and Ghostbusters um, down in, um, oh gosh, down towards Lancaster, mm-hmm. um, because I found out they were playing in there, and I couldn't find them anywhere else. Yep. and I mm-hmm. never saw them in the theater before. Yeah. Well, just have to keep your eye out. Get get to your movies early, and in the thirty minutes beforehand, they'll show you the same advertisement seven times, and that's how you know these yep. things are happening. <laughs> yeah, Maria Marinos. <laughs> oh God, I am so tired of Maria Menudos. I <laughs> <laughs> I clearly go to too many movies because I've I've seen <laughs> I've seen the same ads over and over and over again, uh, mostly for TNT shows. I feel like. <laughs> All right, guys, we got anything else? Nope, I'm good. One thing I wanted to shout out quickly, um, a TV thing and a comic thing. First of all, uh, and, and this is a show that I think is very much rooted in in, in the comic book sensibility. I, I watched the fourth season of Veronica Mars mm. on Hulu. Yes, as did I. And, and I thought it was absolutely tremendous. Uh, and if, if you're a fan of you know detectives and, and noir and if you've never seen this show – uh, they've got all 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 three previous seasons of the movie up on Hulu as well, 
and it, it's I, I was so immensely satisfied by it and uh and definitely not your grandmother's with veronica mars either they took advantage of it being on hulu for this l- latest season <laughs> um but I, I just it's something i would want to highly recommend and the other thing i wanted to point out is uh among us i'm the only one so far who's read superman year one number one by Frank Miller and John Romita Jr. I don't want to spoil anything, but after the rest of our cast or more people have read it and there are other people don't mind being spoiled, we can talk about it in more detail. But I know we were we were kind of dubious about this product project. Some of us were. Um, and all I'll say is that I enjoyed it with some reservations. And I look forward to discussing it uh, down the road. I, I don't know if so, this is a spoiler, but is it the same universe as his Dark Knight? Uh, or is that, too much uh, to that no that, that's not clear yet okay all right yeah I, I doubt they would really make that too clear anyway yeah um if, if not maybe maybe at the end of the series they might they might hint at it um and i and i will say i mean yeah we will we will discuss it more you know when it actually happens but i did i did uh i think i said earlier in the episode i did get to read house of x and am very happy with the direction that it's going. So. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to getting my shipment soon. I look yes. forward to talking about it, brother. Absolutely. Yep. yep. All righty. Is our okay. bolt shot. <laughs> yep. Magazine yep. is empty. Excellent. All right, Matt, glad you got to join us for a little bit here. Right, no problem. Thanks for having me, guys. Always, Thanks. brother. Always. Pleasure, as always. And Shane, you ready? Yep. All righty. Visit us at ComicGeekSpeak.com to send an email. The address is ComicGeekSpeak at gmail.com. Send us some Muddle the Merds. Now that we used one, then we might have a hole. Leave a voicemail. The number is 267-702-6642. Stop by thecomicforums.vanillacommunity.com. Let us know what you think of all the San Diego news and Spider-Man Far From Home. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Thanks to everyone who contributes to the episodes. And for those who do send things, it's certainly never, never expected. But we thank you very, very deeply. As And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes one listener at a time. Me photos of Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs>